Hi, and welcome to episode 10 of the Western Canon Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Alexander Hill, and today we'll be examining the miracle of the West. Okay, so this is a special episode where we'll take a pause from our survey of the great books of the Western canon to do an extended segment of the Liberty Lounge. Today we'll be taking an in-depth look at Jonah Goldberg's excellent new book, Suicide of the West, how the rebirth of tribalism, populism, nationalism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy. The Liberty Lounge, by the way, for listeners who haven't yet tuned in to the first two episodes, Uh, This segment is, in some ways, a book review segment. Uh, For each episode, what I do is I select a great book that focuses on the topic of liberty and freedom and use that book as a jumping off point to discuss um, ideas in depth in a way that often goes beyond the book itself. So the plan moving forward is to do both older texts like John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, uh, maybe some John Locke, maybe some uh, Rothbard, maybe some Burke, some Hayek, Friedman, Notzik, that sort of thing. And then newer texts like Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now uh, will do that this summer. Or Yuval Levin's Fractured Republic, a book that's about uh, subsidiarity. And these uh, types of books and uh, discussions uh, of, of great ideas Uh, will yield for us both a broad and diverse conversation about liberty, freedom, uh, and justice as we examine on this podcast uh, the really great ideals of the Western world. So in this episode, we'll be looking at Jonah Goldberg's fantastic 2018 book, Suicide of the West. Let me just start off by saying that this book is so incredibly good. Um, I haven't read a book this good in years. The book's thesis is centered on the fact that we are living through what Goldberg calls the miracle. Uh, There are several books that have come out in recent uh, times within the last year or so uh, that address this very topic, and I don't think it's an accident. Um, As populism and uh, uh, tribalism and nationalism, as these things are rearing their uh, heads again, I think that uh, thinkers are turning to Uh, Enlightenment ideals, Enlightenment values. Uh, What does the Enlightenment have to say about this? Uh, The Enlightenment that created uh, the possibility of our wealth, our system of natural rights. We are in danger of losing those things. We don't want to lose those things. Um, Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, is one of those books uh, that is very much like Suicide of the West. Ben Shapiro just came out with a new book uh, called The Right Side of History. That is all about uh, Enlightenment ideals. And there are several other uh, books that have come out like very recently that address this topic, and they all take a sort of different track. Um, You know, uh, Steven Pinker's is sort of the progressive liberal left uh, case for the Enlightenment. uh, Ben Shapiro's is sort of the, um, the, you know, sort of hard conservative right um, uh, argument for combining the Enlightenment uh, of the 18th century with uh, Athens and Jerusalem. And so his is sort of the right-wing, classic conservative case. Jonah Goldberg sort of is in the middle somewhere, right? He uh, makes arguments similar to to those of Ben Shapiro's, and he also uh, makes a sort of evidence-based case that the Enlightenment um, has produced sort of um, modernity and the great things that come along with uh, modernity. Um, and that sort of thing. So Jonah Goldberg's book is sort of in the middle there um, and borrows from both camps. The book's thesis is centered on the fact that we are living through what Goldberg calls the miracle. That's sort of the, 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 the center focus of the book. So I'll start by reading the inside flap of the book. Running water, electricity, antibiotics, dentistry, air conditioning, democracy, the rule of law, Such things are not only remarkably new inventions in human history, they are alien to humanity's natural habitat. Here's what is natural. Poverty, hunger, violence, tribal hatred, and early death. If the Garden of Eden existed, it was a slum. Only once in the last 250,000 years did humans lift themselves out of their natural environment of poverty. 
It happened in 18th century England, and it was an accident. If democracy, individualism, and the free market were humankind's destiny, they should have appeared and taken hold a bit earlier in the evolutionary record. The emergence of freedom and prosperity was nothing short of a miracle. Indeed, it was the miracle of human history. As Americans, we are doubly blessed because the radical ideas that made the miracle possible were written not just into the Constitution, but in our hearts, laying the groundwork for our uniquely prosperous society. Those ideas are, our rights come from God, not from the government. The government belongs to us. We do not belong to it. The individual is sovereign. We are all captains of our own souls, not bound by the circumstances of our birth. The fruits of our labors belong to us. In the last few years, these political virtues have been turned into vices. As we are increasingly taught to view our traditions as a system of oppression, exploitation, and privilege, the principles of liberty and the rule of law are under attack from the left and the right. At a moment when authoritarianism, tribalism, identity politics, nationalism, and cults of personality are rotting our democracy from within, Jonah Goldberg exposes the West's suicidal tendencies on both sides of the ideological aisle. With his trademark blend of political history, social analysis, pop culture, and wit, Goldberg makes the timely case that America and other democracies are in peril because they have lost the will to defend the values and institutions that sustain freedom and prosperity. For the West to survive, we must renew our sense of gratitude for what our civilization has given us and rediscover the ideals and habits of the heart that led us out of the bloody muck of the past or back to the muck we will go. And so that's what Goldberg does. Most of the book is an analysis of the, quote, values and institutions and the ideals and habits that account for the progress, prosperity, and unique triumph of the West. So now I'd like to walk you through the main points of the book. Uh, we'll do this in two segments. Uh, this episode, we'll do the first half of Goldberg's book, and then we'll do another episode on the second half. I think his book is so good and introduces so many um, fantastic ideas uh, that we'll have to break it into two parts. So the book starts with a very lengthy but good introductory essay called Stumbling on a Miracle. And I want to spend some time on this essay because it sort of walks readers through an outline, through a blueprint of Goldberg's uh, larger argument in the book. My argument begins with some assertions, he says. Capitalism is unnatural. Democracy is unnatural. Human rights are unnatural. The world we live in today is unnatural, and we stumbled into it more or less by accident. Again, Goldberg calls this accident the miracle. One way of looking at the miracle, says Goldberg, is to think in economic terms. Up until the 1700s, nearly all human beings lived in extreme poverty what today would be the equivalent of $1 to $3 a day. Today, fewer than 10% are living in extreme poverty. The author argues that this progress is a consequence of a radical transformation of thought. Ideas, the author writes, changed everything. Goldberg calls this shift in thinking the Lockean Revolution. Before the emergence of the Lockean Revolution, the state, although it was a necessary precondition of the miracle, was basically a criminal outfit and a giant means of exploitation. Goldberg writes here in the introduction, All states prior to the miracle were designed for the betterment of the tiny slice of humans at the top. Everywhere around the world, rulers saw the masses as little more than instruments of their will. To be sure, humans invented all sorts of theologies and ideologies, such as the divine right of kings, that rationalized these systems as something more noble. But when put to the test, the interests of the rulers always came first." Unquote. In fact, he, uh, Goldberg writes that if you think about our evolutionary history as primates and then as wandering nomadic tribal creatures, there's no clear sign that we were ever destined to live in the way that we do today with democracy, wealth, human rights, science, long life expectancies, uh, and modern conveniences. And moreover, the time frame that we've actually spent living this way pales in comparison to the 200 to 300,000 years, never mind the last five to six million uh, years of innate programming that we've acquired in which we've basically been wired to be tribal creatures. Goldberg writes, in short, all meaning was tribal. 
And as the great economist and philosopher Friedrich Hayek observed, humans are still programmed to understand the world in personal and tribal terms. The secret of the miracle and of modernity itself stems from our ability to hold this tendency in check. It is natural to give preferences to family and friends, members of the tribe, and to see strangers as the enemy, the dangerous other. Unquote. In other words, then, cooperation, right, and the expansion of our definition of what counts as, quote, us, has been one thing responsible for bringing us out of the muck of the past. Goldberg also cites liberalism, uh, by which he means classical liberalism, and capitalism as key systems necessary for the creation of the miracle. The invention of money, the author argues, also made possible this miracle, as it, quote, lowers the barriers to beneficial human interaction. Money reduces the natural tendency to acquire things from strangers through violence by offering the opportunity for commerce. A grocer may be bigoted toward Catholics, Jews, blacks, whites, gays, or some other group, but his self-interest encourages him to overlook such things. Likewise, the customer may not like the grocer, but the customer's self-interest encourages her to put such feelings aside if she wants to buy dinner. In a free market, money corrodes caste and class and lubricates social interaction. Violence, Goldberg writes, is the natural way to get what you want from strangers, and it is zero-sum, unquote. Whereas trade is voluntary and mutually beneficial, both the buyer and the seller need something from the other. For example, if I give the guy at the Apple store $900 for an iPhone, no one's forcing me to do that. I could just as well go without one, plenty of people do. Or I could buy a different phone. Nor can I say that the transaction is unfair. It is a basic Econ 101 fact that if I pay $900 for an iPhone, that means, necessarily, that the iPhone is worth more to me than $900. It's a computer in my pocket with access to the largest repository of knowledge in the world, the internet. It has call, text, GPS, music, podcasts, and just about every other app imaginable. It'll last me five years and I'll use it every day. It's worth way more to me than $900. So what I do is I voluntarily give up my money to buy this item that adds value to my life. If it didn't add value to my life, then I wouldn't buy it. In the same way, the iPhone, since Apple's selling it for $900, costs less than that to make. It is worth less to Apple than $900, or else they'd be selling it for more. In this way, I make a hefty profit. I gladly trade my money for a brilliant product that adds near inestimable value to my life and that I could never build myself. And Apple happily sells me the phone that they built and that I couldn't build. Both Apple and I win. Trade is mutually beneficial. In fact, and this is something that Goldberg points out, capitalism works so well to bring people together to trade cooperatively that in the process, we barely notice we're cooperating. As Goldberg puts it, quote, trade builds trust and encourages strangers to see each other as equals in a transaction. Labor and commerce in a market order create objective metrics to judge people by. As in, quote, I don't care if so-and-so is... You know, pick your group, black, Jewish, gay, Catholic. He does a good job and shows up on time. Liberalism, and I'm still quoting Goldberg here, by enforcing the rule of law and recognizing the rights of everybody, especially property rights, makes trade easier. And trade makes liberalism more desirable. And here, of course, Goldberg is talking about classical liberalism, uh, basically the mantra that uh, you're free to do whatever you want so long as you don't violate the rights of others. Goldberg writes that the miracle is, in many ways, a, quote, bourgeois revolution, a middle-class ideology bolstered by merit, industriousness, innovation, contracts, and rights. That is liberalism. But markets alone aren't enough. Markets and freedom are great, but they don't give people top-down orders. Markets don't provide people meaning from above in the way that ancient orders or modern totalitarian states do. What must fill the gaps that remain is civil society, including those mediating institutions like family, community, school, church, sports, uh, uh, free associations, uh, neighborhood groups, those institutions that are so vital for civilizing individuals and, in fact, which are necessary for the preservation of freedom. It is a healthy civil society, not the state, Goldberg writes, that civilizes people. 
Now at this point, Goldberg gets to the main crux of his project here, a point that sort of explains why the book is titled Suicide of the West. And here he identifies what he sees as several disturbing trends that threaten to upend the miracle. Of the most important of these trends are corruption and ingratitude, as well as the resurgence of tribalism, which can be seen in modern identity politics, populism, uh, a phenomenon that he calls romanticism, and nationalism. The pull of the tribe, writes Goldberg, is inscribed on every human heart, and it can take highly intellectual and sophisticated forms. And perhaps at the heart of this tribal pull and of the modern turn against liberal democratic capitalism is romanticism, which Goldberg argues begins with the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Romanticism is currently plaguing both the left and the right, according to Goldberg, and is increasingly threatening the miracle. The core of romanticism for Rousseau and those who followed, writes Goldberg, is the primacy of feelings. Specifically, the feeling that the world we live in is not right, that it is unsatisfying and devoid of authenticity and meaning, or simply requires too much of us, and there must be an easier way. Secondarily, because our feelings tell us that the world is out of balance, rigged, artificial, unfair, or most often, oppressive and exploitative, our natural wiring drives us to the belief that someone must be responsible." Unquote. As such, the author's claim in this book is that the modern reaction against the liberal order of the miracle is fundamentally romantic in nature. Rather than seeking a stable modern conception of harmony and social organization, romanticism is a primitive call for tribal solidarity and a cry for, quote, a better way. Spoiler alert, writes Goldberg, there isn't one. Okay, so that's the trajectory of the book, and now we get to chapter one. In chapter one, uh, Jonah Goldberg discusses human nature as our inner tribesman, and he runs through various psychological and biological arguments for this fact. Uh, the chapter begins with an announcement by Goldberg that, quote, human nature is real, a fact that many have and do deny. So he starts out by making the case for human nature, right? And then, of course, his argument is going to be that, um, you know, whatever system that we rely on is going to have to acknowledge the facts of our human nature. He then goes on to make the case that ideology is actually downstream of human nature. Quote, children and adults are constantly told that one needs to be taught to hate, Goldberg writes. This is laudable nonsense. We are, in a very real sense, born to hate every bit as much as we are born to love. The task of parents, schools, society, and civilization isn't to teach us not to hate any more than it is to teach us not to love. The role of these institutions is to teach what we should or should not hate. The psychologist Paul Bloom writes that pretty much everyone now believes that it's wrong to hate someone solely because of the color of his or her skin. But this is a modern insight. For most of human history, nobody saw anything wrong with racism. All good people are supposed to hate evil. But the definition of what constitutes evil is rather expansive across time. And refining the definition of evil is the very essence of what civilizations do, writes Goldberg. So the author then runs through a gargantuan and yet uh, disparate and elastic uh, list of things that various civilizations throughout history, including totalitarian regimes, have found both praiseworthy and appalling, including a list of attributes, uh, human universals, he calls them, features of culture, society, language, behavior, etc., that all peoples known throughout ethnography and history uh, have shared. Despite this, many people, including many scholars, particularly among those in the social sciences and humanities, will continue to deny that human beings have a nature. That was actually the motivation behind Steven Pinker's famous work, The Blank Slate, uh, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, which makes the scientific case that human beings do, of course, come preloaded with certain apps, if you will, uh, that we have many innate traits, propensities, and wirings that do shape who we are and how we behave. Pinker in this book attacks those modern theorists who have replaced objective analyses of social problems with sort of feel-good slogans. 
He argues that such a blank slate view of the human being, quote, distorts our understanding of politics, violence, parenting, and the arts, and is partly responsible for the behaviors of various totalitarian regimes that have sought to use social engineering and coercion in attempts to perfect the individual, think communism. The question then is, why do we continue as human beings to deny our own natures? Goldberg explains, quote, I think there are multiple overlapping reasons, many of them laudable, for our aversion to the subject. Our civilization has struggled to live up to the ideals of universal equality enshrined in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and similar canons. Discussion of human nature inevitably bleeds into debates about genetic differences between groups or claims that certain behaviors or choices are unnatural. Discussion of human nature also grinds against the idea that the individual is unconstrained by external or internal restraints, a nearly unique dogma of the West. Another reason why human nature sounds like fighting words is that it's at loggerheads with the French Enlightenment tradition that believes in the perfectibility of man. Unquote. And this is where Jean-Jacques Rousseau comes in. Rousseau popularized the phrase noble savage, a term first used by the poet John Dryden in his 1670 The Conquest of Grenada. Quote, I am as free as nature first made man, wrote Dryden, ere the base laws of servitude began, when in the wild woods the noble savage ran. In his book The Blank Slate, Stephen Pinker writes that, quote, the concept of the noble savage was inspired by European colonists' discovery of indigenous peoples in the Americas, Africa, and later, Oceania. It captures the belief that humans in their natural state are selfless, peaceable, and untroubled, and that blights such as greed, anxiety, and violence are the products of civilization. Rousseau backs up this claim in his work, The Social Contract, writing, quote, Nothing is more gentle than man in his primitive state, as he is placed by nature at an equal distance from the stupidity of brutes and the fatal ingenuity of civilized man. Arthur Herman, who is the author of several great works, including The Cave in the Light, uh, he had this to say about uh, Rousseau, quote, Rousseau reversed the poles of civilization and barbarism, his paeons of praise for primitive man, who lives in effortless harmony with nature and his fellow human beings, were meant as a reproach against the idea of history as progress. Goldberg claims that Rousseau's rebellion against Enlightenment values, his romanticism, his rejection of human nature, is not only wrongheaded, but that these ideas make him an enemy of true progress. Goldberg writes, quote, for Rousseau, the advent of private property, the development of the arts, and the general advancement of human health and prosperity were actually giant steps backwards. It is my argument that Romanticism shouldn't be understood as a school of art, literature, or philosophy, but as a school of rebellion against the unnatural nature of the Enlightenment and all of the Enlightenment's offspring, including capitalism, democracy, natural rights, and science. The romantic spirit rebels against the iron cage of modernity, demanding a return to an imagined authenticity and harmony with nature. Romantic rebellion is less an argument and more of a primal yawp. It's a feeling that the world around us is dehumanizing, fake, artificial, and oppressive, unquote. Here Goldberg uh, is making the case that it is just this romanticism, this immature Rousseauian feelings-based sense that modern man is corrupted by society that is dominating our culture right now. Whether we're talking about the social justice left, the Bernie Sanders democratic socialist left, the Trumpian populist right, or what have you, there seems to be an ideological nostalgia and a feelings-based resentment fostered by a politics of victimhood that just won't go away. This alienation and this nostalgia, according to Goldberg, stems from a form of romanticism that basically ignores facts, especially facts about the progress we have made as a species in the modern age. In chapter one, Goldberg devotes a stretch of pages to analyzing how truly violent the past was, especially prior to modernity. The 20th century may be regarded as the bloodiest century, and rightly so if you consider the catastrophes of communism and fascism, but things were even worse for prehistoric man. Roughly one-third of primitive humans in small-scale societies died from raids and fights alone. 
Goldberg writes, quote, This is no longer a debated point among most serious scholars. People who think we once lived in glorious harmony with each other and the environment aren't scientists. They're poets and propagandists. The evidence for mankind's blood-soaked past can be found in the archaeological record, DNA analysis, the writings of ancient commentators and historians, and the first-hand reports of those remaining societies that have so far resisted modernity. Napoleon Chagnon, the famous anthropologist who lived among the Yanomamo people for long stretches of time in the 20th century, for example, said that Yanomamo culture was a state of chronic warfare. He also reported that roughly 44% of men over the age of 25 had participated in killing someone. One third of adult male deaths were from violence. And none of this is to say anything about the slavery of the past. We forget that after the agricultural revolution roughly 11,000 years ago, slavery emerges almost everywhere, Goldberg writes. The Bible takes it as a given in human affairs. The Code of Hammurabi says that freeing a slave is a crime punishable by death. In China, slavery goes all the way back to 1800 BC. The Romans, the Greeks, the Chinese, the Egyptians, and nearly every other culture considered slavery to be not only right, but natural. American slavery, which we now rightly regard as an unforgivable stain on our national identity, was just as terrible, but even more hypocritical, since America was born with the Declaration of Independence's promise that all men are created equal. Against the backdrop of the last 10,000 years, Goldberg writes, the amazing thing about slavery is not that it existed, but that we put an end to it. But it took modernity and capitalism to do so. England outlawed the slave trade in 1807. America banned the trade of slaves in 1808. The Dutch did the same in 1814. The Congress of Vienna condemned slavery. Britain abolished slavery in all of its colonies in 1834. The Dutch followed with complete abolition in 1863. In America, we lagged behind, officially ending the practice of slavery with the 13th Amendment in 1865 after a bloody, painful, and costly war. And that all of this came about in the 19th century, as our economies were modernizing, argues the author, this was not coincidental. Quote, the timing was not coincidental, writes economist Don Bordreau. The fact is that slavery disappeared only as industrial capitalism emerged. And it disappeared first where industrial capitalism appeared first, Great Britain. This was no coincidence. Slavery was destroyed by capitalism. Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, writes Goldberg, not only opposed slavery on moral grounds, but also considered it incompatible with the free market. Smith writes, quote, It appears accordingly from the experience of all ages and nations that the work done by free men comes cheaper in the end than the work performed by slaves. And from a purely economic perspective, leaving the domain of morality, obviously slavery is pure evil, Capitalism, of course, will always be more productive than slavery. Slaves are not productive workers, but capitalism, on the other hand, incentivizes hard work and innovation. People work harder when they have an independent stake in their work, when they own their own labor, when they own the fruits of their labor. Of the slave, Adam Smith writes that, quote, whatever work he does beyond what is sufficient to purchase his own maintenance can be squeezed out of him by violence only and not by any interest of his own. Now, Goldberg does admit that certainly in America it took a war to end slavery, but he argues that capitalism, which is a system based on freedom and property rights, and the liberal democratic order, those were things that made slavery a clear contradiction to the American way of life. And so this contradiction, in part, precipitated the war that would come to end American slavery. Take the freedoms that undergird capitalism out of America, or as Goldberg puts it, take the Declaration of Independence out of it, and American slavery was normal. As MIT economists Daniel Asimoglu and Alexander Wolitsky write, quote, Standard economic models of the labor market, regardless of whether they incorporate imperfections, assume that transactions in the labor market are free. For most of human history, however, the bulk of labor transactions have been coercive, meaning that the threat of force was essential in convincing workers to take part in the employment relationship, and thus in determining compensation. 
Slavery and forced labor were the most common forms of labor transactions in most ancient civilizations, including Greece, Egypt, Rome, several Islamic and Asian empires, and most known pre-Columbian civilizations. Goldberg goes on to note that the very idea that human beings can sell their services freely in the open marketplace, the fact that they can engage in trade voluntarily, free from force and coercion, is a very recent idea. Socialism and communism, on the other hand, while claiming to oppose slavery and oppression, almost always leads to slavery in the form of forced labor. Command economies, Goldberg writes, are just that, command economies. The Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, Communist China, and North Korea have all widely used forced labor. In fact, it's nonsense to equate American slavery with capitalism, especially since slavery violates all of capitalism's rules. Deirdre McCloskey, who writes eloquently on this topic, says as much in a recent essay in Reason Magazine. Quote, The economic idea implied, McCloskey writes, that exploitation made us rich is mistaken. Slavery made a few Southerners rich, a few Northerners too, but it was ingenuity and innovation that enriched Americans generally, including at last the descendants of slaves. She then goes on to dispel the myth that the rise of capitalism depended on the making of cotton cloth in England and America. The raw cotton, so the mistaken idea goes, could only come from the South. The growing of cotton, in turn, is said to have depended on slavery. The conclusion that anti-capitalists reach here is that capitalism was conceived in the sin of slavery. Yet each step in the logic of these historians, McCloskey writes, is mistaken. The enrichment of the modern world did not depend on cotton textiles. Cotton mills, true, were pioneers of some industrial techniques, techniques applied to wool and linen as well, but many other techniques in iron making and engineering and mining and farming had nothing to do with cotton. Britain in 1790 and the U.S. in 1860 were not nation-sized cotton mills, unquote. McCloskey in her article then goes on to discuss the fact that beyond how appalling and sinful slavery is and was, slavery doesn't even make sense from a cold, calculating, purely economic standpoint. For slaves of any race aren't and never will be, again, as I mentioned, productive workers. Not only does the slave master have to pay to feed, clothe, house, and tend medically to slaves, but in slavery, the workers aren't productive. Why would they be? They have no incentive to be productive. And of course, they don't innovate. The Southern economy in the United States, according to slavery scholar Eugene Genovese, was non-capitalistic and pre-bourgeoisie. It was a pre-industrialized economy that struggled to thrive due to the lack of incentives imposed by slave labor, the absence of a legal framework that stimulated the emergence of capitalism, and a backward agriculture-based economy. According to Genovese, slaveholders were, quote, pre-capitalist aristocrats imbued with an anti-bourgeois spirit with values and mores which subordinated the drive for profit to honor, luxury, ease of accomplishment, and family. As Luis Pablo de la Jora notes, and here he's writing for FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education, quote, the South was an inefficient economy where the entrepreneurial search for profits typical of capitalist economies was secondary. Instead, a quasi-aristocratic class, the planters, acted like medieval landowners, more concerned about their culture of honor, power, and appearances than maximizing actual profits. De La Jora goes on, quote, The thesis on the capitalistic nature of the South's economic system seems very difficult to maintain. It cannot be denied that the South incorporated certain aspects of capitalism due to the fact that its economy largely depended on the demand for cotton that came from several parts of the world, However, the South lagged behind the North in terms of urbanization and economic and social development precisely because market capitalism did not seep through the channels of the Southern economy. Later in Chapter 1, uh, to bolster his claim that capitalism is an essential part of the miracle, Goldberg then goes on to discuss other forms of social and economic arrangements, such as caste systems. He writes, quote, In numerous societies, India arguably the most famous, the whole of the population was divided up into different categories of ascribed status called castes. These castes set the acceptable parameters of virtually every meaningful pursuit in life, including the places one could live, whom one could marry, and even what kinds of occupations one could hold. 
Europe's caste system was perhaps less austere, but no less binding, with categories of serfs, peasants, nobility, and other rankings of humans' innate worth. Unquote. After more discussion of human nature, chapter 2 opens by reminding readers of the central lesson of William Golding's Lord of the Flies, citing that famous line delivered by the rotting pig's head on a pike, who says that the beast is not something that you can hunt and kill, because the real beast resides inside us all. That internal beast, writes Goldberg, is, quote, human nature. It cannot be killed, despite what utopian dreamers tell you. It can only be tamed. The story of civilization, writes Goldberg, is quite literally the story of taming, directing, channeling, or holding at bay human nature. Here the author discusses the historical ubiquity of rape. A common feminist slogan, chides the author, is that men must be taught not to rape. Some seem to believe that this is a stance against some camp of pro-rape pedagogy out there, but on its plain meaning, the feminists are right. Men must be taught not to rape because rape is natural. Rape was considered by countless societies to be the natural extension of military conquest. When the Yanomamo people capture a woman, the whole raiding party gets to rape her. She's then brought to the village where anyone else who wants to rape her may do so. Afterwards, she is forced to be some man's wife. Jonathan Gottschall, in his article explaining wartime rape, concludes, In short, historical and anthropological evidence suggests that rape in the context of war is an ancient human practice and that this practice has stubbornly prevailed across a stunningly diverse concatenation of societies and historical epochs. This is why it's significant that the social norms that render rape taboo, morally wrong, reprehensible, and evil, these norms are modern inventions, or constructs of our civilization, as Goldberg puts it. The key point here, he writes, is that when we witness the evil of rape, some part of us recognizes it for what it is. It's not an expression of capitalist culture, but a regression to man's basest self. Long before feminism took up the cause of fighting rape, civilization had been working to make it unacceptable. Rape is a tangible manifestation of the corruption of civilized behavior. If you want to return to the time of the mythical noble savage, you want to return to a time when rape was a routine and an acceptable practice in human affairs." Unquote. One tool, then, for keeping human nature in check is the idea of virtue. The definitions of virtue are many, says Goldberg, but they all have one thing in common. They are united by the idea that, quote, virtuous people adhere to a moral code above mere selfishness. Virtue, explains the author, requires denying one's baser instincts, i.e. human nature, and doing what is right. And this ties in very nicely to what we're going to be talking about in upcoming episodes, uh, because, you know, once we're done exploring Plato, we will then move on to Aristotle and we'll take a look at his virtue ethics. Courage, writes C.S. Lewis, is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. In short, virtue takes effort. Virtue, if it is to be exercised, also requires that there be mediating institutions in place that encourage the cultivation of that virtue. In his book, The Origins of Political Order, Francis Fukuyama argues that there are, quote, universal characteristics of all human societies, fixed features of the human condition that political orders must work with rather than deny or erase if they are to be successful. Fukuyama writes, quote, Inclusive fitness, kin selection, and reciprocal altruism are default modes of sociability. All human beings gravitate toward the favoring of kin and friends with whom they have exchanged favors, unless strongly incentivized to do otherwise. Without these, quote, strong countervailing incentives, argues Fukuyama later, civilizations slide decadently into patrimonialism, corruption, hypocrisy, complacency, resentment, and what Goldberg calls manufactured tribalism, which today we might call identity politics. When this happens, it is often a corruption of the elites. Goldberg writes, quote, Elites succumb to the temptations of human nature, and in their corruption, the civilization loses the integrity that made it great in the first place. And yet this focus on the elites, while it, quote, leads to a lot of populist fantasies fueled by, quote, people-powered movements, 
is only half the story. Civilizations can also die, and often do, when the masses are corrupted too. Today, Goldberg writes, there is a low-simmering Jacobin fever aimed at the so-called 1%. This bland description of economic elites is logically ludicrous, given that it is a fact of math that there will always be a top 1%. Goldberg dedicates the rest of this chapter to describing the sorts of pathologies and bugs of human nature that have upended civilizations and which threaten to topple our miracle. After discussing the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church, the Janissaries of the Ottoman Empire, the Qin Dynasty of China, and other groups, Goldberg turns to America's founders and other Enlightenment intellectuals who knew that along with the cultivation of virtue, pluralism was necessary to guard against those elements of human nature, as I mentioned, nepotism, corruption, hypocrisy, complacency, resentment, and manufactured tribalism, those elements of human nature that would threaten to topple the miracle. Pluralism, says the author, implies the idea that power should be distributed widely in a society. According to Nobel Prize winning economist Douglas C. North, quote, when you only have a handful of stakeholders in a society, usually the priests, the landholding aristocrats, the military, maybe some guilds and bureaucrats, and of course the monarch, power, then, is defined by the personal relationships between a tiny handful of elites. This ruling elite forms what Goldberg calls, quote, a ruling coalition against the masses, as they design the system for their own benefit. This is what we have to avoid in order to preserve the miracle. Instead, what we need is institutional pluralism, whereby the elites agree to general rules that bind everyone, including the elites themselves. Institutional pluralism would also argue that successful institutions should attract a broad and diverse array of talent from as broad a base as possible. Ultimately, Goldberg writes, quote, this gives birth to the rule of law, which holds that winners are bound by the same rules as losers and that no one can wield arbitrary power. This gave birth to a system, he continues, where respect for dissident or hostile elites and institutions out of power was written into law, and more importantly, into the culture. A critical mass of institutions and a balance of power among them forced elites to forego using violence against each other to settle political disputes. This required creating not only political and social space for disagreement, but psychological acceptance of the idea that people had a right to be wrong and thus through institutional pluralism, protection for freedom of speech is born. This was a conceptual breakthrough in the history of humanity, Goldberg writes. In traditional societies and modern authoritarian ones as well, the only check on power is power. A king might refrain from crushing a powerful but troublesome nobleman, but not because the law prevents him. The only thing truly preventing rulers from destroying rival elites is a Game of Thrones style cost-benefit analysis. Will attacking this lord be too expensive in terms of military resources or gold? Will doing so encourage even more dissent? Will I get in trouble from the church? Now, when it came to primitive societies, the author points out, quote, Such calculations were far simpler. Can we take them by surprise? Do we have enough spears? And so on. Institutional pluralism, continues Goldberg, not only imposed certain constraints on elites, but also constrained what elites could do with the state. In societies where the state picks sides, punishes dissidents, crushes minority faiths, etc., control of the state becomes everything. In societies where there are a multitude of institutions, a cognitive switch is flipped, and people suddenly understand that everyone has a vested interest in keeping the rules of the game fair for everyone. This, Goldberg argues, is a foundational pillar of the American founders' philosophy. But pluralism also means having a plurality of meanings and identities in the society. Quote, when all of your identity is bound up in a single group or cause, your concern for institutions and people outside of your group diminishes or vanishes. The Praetorian who only cares for the guard, as a matter of logic, does not care about his family, his country, his faith, or anything else, writes Goldberg. This network of identities and associations create a society in which openness is a necessity and tolerance is a must. In an open society, writes Goldberg, a Catholic soldier may have Protestant brothers in arms, a Jewish doctor has genteel patients, the African-American policeman counts white officers as fellow brothers of the badge. Now, this point seems to echo the Harvard psychologist Robert Putnam's claim that diversity is great, 
so long as we're all working towards shared goals and have some shared values. This may mean, Goldberg adds, that we have weaker attachments to any specific identity, but that's the price we pay for peace and freedom. Pluralism requires tolerance and forces us to open ourselves up to the possibility that our identity is not the only true or right one. As human beings, we are tribal creatures. We evolved to wander in tight-knit groups united to fight other groups, and we circle around sacred objects, totems, if you will, and this is uh, according to the philosophy of Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Righteous Mind. We unite into groups to fight common enemies. That's just what we do. We fight common enemies that uh, we feel would threaten that which we hold sacred. Despite our attempts to rewire ourselves, that is just what we do. The great success of America is that the U.S., unlike many European nations, is a creedal nation. We too circle around a sacred object. We too have established an in-group, and we circle around a totem. But that totem is the flag. That totem is supposed to be the Constitution. In other nations, in many European and even Eastern nations, that in-group membership is based on blood and soil. You can move to France, but you can't just become a Frenchman. You have to be French. I'll quote a 2018 article from The Atlantic. Quote, For all its flaws, the United States is uniquely equipped to unite a diverse and divided society. Alone among the world powers, America has succeeded in forging a strong group transcending national identity without requiring citizens to shed or suppress their subgroup identities. In the United States, you can be Irish American, Syrian American, or Japanese American, and be intensely patriotic at the same time. We take this for granted, but consider how strange it would be to call someone Irish French or Japanese Chinese, unquote. And so that was from a 2018 uh, Atlantic article. And that is because in America, we're supposed to be circling around a sacred object. That's true. But that sacred object is freedom. Freedom to worship how one chooses. Freedom to speak one's conscience. Freedom to associate freely without coercion. Freedom to live and express oneself how one chooses. And freedom to pursue happiness as long as one is not violating others' rights to do the same. Institutional pluralism, then, and a division of commitments and labors makes the project of modernity possible. And it is in this way that the project of what activists call social justice is actually a threat to true institutional pluralism, according to Goldberg, and the flourishing of what he calls the miracle. The author writes here in chapter 2, Spend a few minutes actually studying what activists mean by social justice, and you'll discover that it is often a reactionary effort. It claims that the rule of law is a rigged system designed to protect the interests of the patriarchy, or white privilege, or the 1%. Social justice holds that abstract rules or timeless principles are inadequate if they don't lead to redistributive or economic justice. In other words, as Friedrich Hayek famously observed, social justice is about the subjective will to power of a tribal coalition, not universal principles. Unquote. This is probably what commentators like Ben Shapiro mean when they say that justice is a word that does not need a modifier. Look, if a particular group is suffering from injustice, even if it's just one group suffering, the remedy to this injustice is not group justice or social justice, but just plain justice. It is unjust by itself to deny groups rights based on the color of their skin or their membership in some ethnic or religious group. The solution is justice. Social justice, so far as I can tell, is not about rights. It's a push for equality of outcome. If group A does not possess the same amount of wealth as group B, there must be oppression happening. If group B is not represented in some field of employment to the same degree as group C, there must be injustice happening. But social justice ignores the fact that inequality of outcome does not imply inequality of opportunity. It ignores the fact that disparate outcomes do not alone or necessarily imply disparate treatment. So let's just run with the social justice logic. For example, 92% of the prison population is male in the United States. Yikes, right? Big disparity must be oppression. According to the social justice logic, this disparity in outcome is necessarily some kind of oppression. It's unjust. This disparity must mean that women are oppressing men, right? 
Well, see, they wouldn't admit that, right? Because it only swings one way. Right? If we run with the social justice logic, this should be female privilege, right? Is that just by being a male in society, um, I have a greater likelihood of going to jail. Look at this disparity. Isn't it unfair? Look at the outcome, right? 92% of the prison population is male. That's unjust. We need social justice for men, right? Women have female privilege in society, right? No. Wrong. Wrong. 92% of the prison population is male because men commit the vast majority of violent crimes. And that happens for a variety of reasons. Men are more aggressive. They have higher levels of testosterone, etc., etc. So this type of reasoning is tribalistic, and it does not uh, give proper regard to statistics or logic. Okay, and so uh, in the end, social justice turns out to look quite a bit anti-pluralistic. Goldberg continues here to extol the virtues of pluralism, which includes an important division between what the German sociologists call Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft. Gesellschaft, one way to remember the meaning of this word is to emphasize the cell in Gesellschaft. Gesellschaft is the external, impersonal uh, domain or order of contracts, commerce, and the law, whereas Gemeinschaft is the personal order of family, friends, and community. The Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft are two distinct realms, worlds, really, that we live in that are both deeply necessary, but that are quite different from one another. Humans, says Goldberg, were not designed to live in the market order of contracts, money, or impersonal rules, never mind huge societies governed by a centralized state. We were designed to live in bands, or what most people think of as tribes. The human brain is designed so that we can manage stable social relationships with roughly 150 people, is what research shows. This is called Dunbar's number. Quote, we still hold on to that programming, and it rubs up against modernity constantly, says Goldberg. This world of 150 or so that we interact with frequently, made up of friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, etc., is the Gemeinschaft. And people often get confused, believing that the government, the state, should be operating on the principles that govern the Gemeinschaft. But this goes against the grain of human nature. That's because, Goldberg writes, quote, We are wired to help our friends and family in ways that we are not when it comes to strangers. And according to the author, this is okay. This is where money, trade, commerce, business, contracts, and so on come in. The Gesellschaft. The author explains, quote, People who think money is a corrupting force in life fail to appreciate that we simply cannot treat everyone as friends or family. The glory of money and the rule of law is that it empowers us to cooperate with strangers. One needn't know, never mind be related to, the butcher one buys a rasher of bacon from. A rich man and a poor man have the right to buy whatever product they wish so long as they have the required funds to make the purchase. The democratizing power of money is one of the great forgotten advances of humanity." Unquote. Family and the Gemeinschaft, however, does not operate according to the rules of market order, the author continues. Indeed, in my family, Goldberg points out, we are communists in the sense that we operate under the maxim, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. I do not charge my daughter for food, and my wife and I do not present anyone with a bill for the household chores we do. If a friend or relative needs to sleep in my house or borrow my car, that falls under the natural tribal economy of reciprocity, or, more simply, favors. But if a stranger wants to use my car or sleep in the house, the rules are very different. And this is an important point because it actually bolsters uh, Jonah Goldberg's claim regarding corruption. Quote, the greatest force in the corruption of modernity, writes Goldberg, is the organized political effort active in every generation to impose the rules of Gemeinschaft on the Gesellschaft. The problem, says the author, is that the market order is unnatural. And because it doesn't feel natural, it leaves many people cold, particularly those who are impoverished in the currency of Gemeinschaft. That would be community, friendship, family. Every anti-capitalist political ideology is a variant of the idea that society should operate like a family, a tribe, a small community, where everyone knows each other. Identity politics is just a subset of this worldview. It says, quote, my tribe deserves more than your tribe. 
And now we reach chapter 3, which begins part 2 of Suicide of the West. Now that Goldberg has described what the miracle is and has detailed several threats to its existence, the chapters in part two are devoted to explaining not only how the miracle of liberal democracy, capitalism, the rule of law, ordered liberty, limited government, and the Constitution came to be, but they also describe the work that needs to be done to preserve its fruits. Okay, so now we reach chapter three. It's called The State, A Myth Agreed Upon. Part two of Suicide of the West begins with a question, how did we get from the world of hunter-gatherers to the state? One notion people have is that of the Enlightenment theory known as the social contract. There are a few variants of this theory, but they all pretty much agree with one principle, that men in a state of nature agree to sacrifice some personal freedoms in exchange for peace and security. For Hobbes, who, unlike Rousseau, believes that in a state of nature our lives are, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and that we're fallen, sinful, greedy, selfish, grasping creatures. For Hobbes, it is only through society's mediating institutions, so family, church, uh, community organizations, the state, it is only through those things that our corrupt natures are kept in line. And so this is the point of civilization. Life in a state of nature, according to Hobbes, is filled with violence, tribal warfare, cannibalism, rape, death. It's awful. And so men in a state of nature uh, will have to sacrifice many personal freedoms in exchange for security. Hobbes' social contract then gives license to an all-powerful state, the Leviathan, to protect humanity from itself and from life in a state of nature. Locke's social contract, on the other hand, takes the best of Hobbes and the best of Rousseau, insisting on certain fundamental natural rights. In fact, the whole point of the state is to protect individuals' natural rights, and seeing the state as a servant of the people, according to Locke, rather than a master of them. To this, Goldberg writes, quote, What unites pretty much all of the classical understandings of the social contract is that they are wrong. There never was any such thing as a real existing social contract, Goldberg continues. Prior to the Enlightenment, there's no record of any large group of people, primitive or otherwise, voluntarily coming together to write down or agree to the kinds of social contract that philosophers describe. It's a useful myth, a vital lie. A social contract is, to borrow a term, a social construct. Instead of calling it a social contract, Goldberg argues that a more accurate way of thinking about how the government emerges from a state of nature is what economist McCurr Olson calls the stationary bandit. Before the stationary bandits, there existed only roving bandits, a permanent fixture of the, quote, state of nature. Roving bandits include raiders, marauders, warlords, and other figures who would pass through a community or village, especially during the early agricultural revolution, and steal anything that they could, money, food, weapons, equipment, crops, women, children, etc. The roving bandit phenomenon goes all the way back to hunter-gatherer days, but ramps up during the beginning of the agricultural revolution. This is because, unlike nomadic tribes, who are moving targets, agricultural communities stay put, and in this way, are vulnerable. Quote, Being plundered of their food stores and equipment and having their able-bodied males slaughtered was often a catastrophic event. The consequences of roving bandits were long-lasting for their victims. If you know you are likely to fall prey to whichever band of thieves might come your way, you're unlikely to make any long-term investments. Why toil in the fields or restore your granaries if you know that the Huns or the Sumerians or whoever will just come and take it all again? Unquote. Uh, McCurr Olson writes, quote, In a world of roving banditry, there is little or no incentive for anyone to produce or accumulate anything that may be stolen, and thus little for bandits to steal. You can already see how this becomes an issue for the bandits and pillagers. Once you've robbed a village once, maybe twice, the villagers that you steal from become disincentivized to produce food, goods, and wealth in abundance, knowing that it will just be stolen from them in short order. Just as good hunting grounds or fisheries can be depleted by overuse, you can only raid and plunder the same village so many times before there's not much left to steal, particularly when the victims refuse to make futile long-term investments, writes Goldberg. It's a vicious cycle that leaves both thief and victim poorer in the long run. Hence the birth of the stationary bandit, which eventually becomes, over time, the modern state. Here the author tells the story of White Wolf, 
a marauder in 1920s China. Apparently, White Wolf roamed the countryside, plundering and raiding villages. Eventually, an even more powerful warlord, Feng Yusheng, defeated White Wolf. Goldberg writes, quote, The interesting thing is that the villagers welcomed Feng Yusheng as a kind of savior, even though he taxed, i.e. extorted, the local population heavily. Why welcome one warlord over another? Goldberg asks. That is because Feng Yusheng settled down. He stayed put, and therefore he provided the villagers protection from those roving bandits. This protection gave the peasants a stability and a sense of tranquil predictability that they had not had before. For as long as they continued to give their money, their dues, to their protectors, their lives would be spared. And this allowed them to produce with some measure of confidence and look to the future. McCurr Olson explains the logic of the stationary bandit, a vast improvement over the conditions that existed before. Quote, it's really just math, Olson writes. A stationary bandit has a longer time horizon. He realizes that taking 100% of a village's wealth will make him richer right now. But what will he get next year? Nothing. Now, if he takes half this year, he knows there will be something to take next year. He also realizes that if he lets the villagers plant more crops, there will also be more for him to tax in the years ahead. This gives the stationary bandit an incentive not just to fend off the roving bandits, but to make investments in public goods other than security. He might build roads or lend resources for the digging of new irrigation canals or the clearing of forests to plow new fields. The concept of the stationary bandit is the original model of the state. This dynamic, says Goldberg, quote, probably defined the earliest days of the agricultural revolution, when the first bands and tribes settled down to grow crops. From there, the author writes, it was inevitable that the state, as we understand it today, would emerge. In modern Western societies, the state protects its citizens from violence and coercion and protects the right of the citizens to use and hold its property. Without the guarantee that the police will stop the burglar from robbing the bakeries, Goldberg points out, the bakers will not bake bread, and thus wealth cannot be created. Because a stationary bandit has an interest in letting his subjects get richer, writes Goldberg, his slice of the pie gets bigger when the whole pie gets bigger, he must protect the lives and property of his clients if they are to keep working for him. This protection allows for labor to become more specialized, and thus more wealth can be created. This also necessitates property rights. Quote, when you own land, Goldberg continues, you can extract more productivity or wealth from it. More wealth and security from external foes means more population, and more population means more wealth and security. It's a virtuous cycle, unquote. For Goldberg, maybe the most important aspect of a civilization that generates prosperity, promotes virtue, protects natural rights, is this division of labor. Here he cites the case of the, quote, humble sandwich, inspired by Leonard Reed's classic libertarian text, I Pencil. In 2015, this guy apparently set out to make a sandwich completely from scratch. And by scratch, we're talking literally from scratch. He used nothing in the sandwich that um, he didn't make himself, from growing the veggies uh, to milking cows to cultivate cheese to growing wheat to killing his own chickens. And apparently this whole process took the man six months and cost him $1,500. And so that obviously um, bolsters the argument that the division of labor is extremely important to leading a life where leisure is possible, where uh, the creation of wealth is possible, where we can uh, benefit from the uh, specialized skills of artisans and things like that. So uh, Goldberg talks about uh, examples like these, and at this point, Goldberg goes into a lengthy exposition tracing the emergence of the first quote-unquote states. Uh, and in this discussion, he talks about Mesopotamia, Sumeria, uh, Hammurabi's Code, and here we arrive at chapter four of uh, Suicide of the West, and chapter four is called The Birth of Capitalism, A Glorious Accident. So in our next episode of the Liberty Lounge, our second and final episode on Jonah Goldberg's Suicide of the West, we'll discuss um, some of the greatest hits from chapters four, five, six, uh, probably eight and nine, which deal respectively with uh, chapter four, capitalism, five, a reason versus religion, six, the American miracle, um, 
Eight, the progressive era, the birth of the living constitution and the death of liberty. And nine, the administrative state, the shadow government. Uh, so there are 14 chapters uh, in the book in total. But this, um, my sampling will give listeners sort of the gist of things and will leave you guys with some incentive to still uh, pick up a copy of Goldberg's book, which contains all of the ideas that I'm presenting and more. Um, uh and you, and you really you should buy it. It's a fantastic book. I wholeheartedly recommend it. And I am going to try to get Jonah Goldberg on the show. I sent him one email, but so far he hasn't responded to that. Okay, so now what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to address a couple of mailbag questions. Um, the reason I haven't done a mailbag segment before is that I get plenty of um, uh, comments and emails and feedback and uh, social media messages and all sorts of things about the podcast. I probably get uh, at least a message every day from someone. But uh, in the past, the messages in the mailbag that I've gotten have been comments, what people like, what people don't like about the show, what people want me to cover. Um, one person uh, announced a mistake I had made about a geographical location. Um, and I'm, I've been getting lots and lots of comments, and that's really fantastic. But um, what I was hoping for with the mailbag was um, actual productive questions that I could address on the show. And so we've got a couple of those today. And so we're going to do a mailbag segment. Here we go. Okay, so this first one is from Sean. Jordan, I have started listening to your podcast and I really enjoy it. It gets to the basis of what I love about art, literature, and the positive aspect of humanity. I'm currently finishing my AA, I suppose that's probably an associate's of some sort, in English at a community college in Colorado. I would love to be a professor like yourself one day, maybe. Uh, just in my ethnic literature class, I am getting inundated with this sort of postmodern critique on everything. While I'm talking about the actual content of the work, I'm getting resistance from my professor to essentially give her the answer she wants, a reductive, everything is nefarious critique. I'm spending thousands of dollars and I want an actual education, not the world as seen by her. What did you do about this when you were an undergrad and beyond? Okay, Sean, so um, good question, uh, Sean. Thanks so much for getting in touch. By the way, I do want to say that I'm not technically a professor. I've taught college classes, and technically I'm teaching a college class right now, uh, but I am a teacher. I teach in an advanced charter school for very talented and bright students who are interested in math and science. My wife is a professor, though. Um, thank you for your message. So here's my advice for you. For now, uh, what I want to say is that you have a choice to make. You can do the safe, pragmatic thing, you know, and just bite your tongue in class so that you can get your degree, so that you can uh, move on with your life and do what you need to do that requires a degree uh, and sort of bite your tongue and just let things roll off your back uh, and then study the great books in your free time. That way you're getting the benefit of reading the actual great books, uh, the benefits that come along with um, reading the great books, the humanistic, uh, the aesthetic the sort of soul nourishing benefits. Um, or you can go, on the other hand, into full gadfly mode and challenge your teachers relentlessly. Uh, what are they going to do, right? They can't kick you out of class. Um, it will be awkward, right? It'll be a little bit awkward. Um, there'll be tension. Um, I know I'm speaking about it kind of casually now, but I know in the moment uh, when nobody in your class agrees with you, it is difficult to be the one to stand up and speak out against groupthink. Um, and so, so your what I what I think uh, your two options are are you bite your tongue, you put your head down, you get your degree, uh, you stay quiet in class and do your work, and uh, there's no drama. Uh, and then you study the great books in your free time, or you can go full on gadfly and challenge your teachers and your classmates relentlessly. I did the former as an undergraduate, right? I put my head down and I tried to be completely open minded about everything until sort of the uh, slant to my education started to build up and um, I found myself needing to speak out. So I did the former as an undergraduate and I did the latter speaking out sort of relentlessly as a gadfly, I did that as a graduate student. The latter is more fun and empowering uh, to me. 
uh, but it's also more stressful. It's um, it's not easy to 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 be hated. It's not easy to be the one person in class, uh, the pariah, the the outcast uh, that um, steps outside the echo chamber. Um, the former, not speaking out, is safer. It's less anxiety inducing. But the downside to that is that you will feel weak and passive. You will feel like other people are controlling the discourse, that other people are controlling the culture, and that you're not getting the education that you deserve. So it's up to you either way. Um, Read the great books in your spare time, regardless of which option you choose. They'll never fail you, and they'll make your life worth living. Um, So uh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, and uh, uh, this one is from Anke Fritsch, and this person is one of my Patreon uh, supporters, my patrons, so that is excellent. I just want to say thank you for your work. I will finally be able to explore the Western canon following your podcast and then read the relevant literature. I could not find my way through all of this by myself. Well, thank you, Anke Fritsch. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you for being a Patreon contributor. Um, know, just know that I wouldn't be able to do this podcast without folks like you supporting me. Uh, this one is from Sarah H. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. She says, I just found your show about a week ago. I'm a PhD student, and this is exactly what I needed. Your episodes on the Iliad and the Odyssey, as well as your interviews with people like Daniel Mendelssohn, Emily Wilson, and Edith Hall are fantastic. I do have one question, however. With all due respect, it looks like the podcast is taking somewhat of a libertarian perspective, which is fine, but I'm mostly here for your long form of episodes on the great books. Will you be continuing to do long episodes that explore the great books with summary analysis and discussion? Thanks and keep up the great work. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Thank you, Sarah, for supporting the show. The short answer is yes, I will continue to do long episodes that fully examine works of literature. Um, Right now we are up to Plato in our chronological survey of Western literature. We've done an episode exploring Plato's Republic. That was with Dr. Nathan Schluter from Hillsdale College. I have a conversation coming up with um, Gina Santiago on Plato. Gina is um, has been my Western canon correspondent, and she's doing her dissertation on Plato. Uh, and in that same episode with Gina, I plan to talk about some of Plato's philosophical ideas, including things like his theory of the forms. Also, because you mentioned her by name, Edith Hall, I'm happy to announce, is coming back on the show. I actually have an interview with her this Sunday focusing on her brand new book, Aristotle's Way. So we'll be moving into Aristotle territory pretty soon here, and I'll be doing an entire episode on Aristotle's virtue ethics. So that should be a good time. As for the libertarian bent that the show often takes, yes, that is true. I do take a libertarian bent on the show. Um... And even the simple fact that I would have a segment on the program called the Liberty Lounge probably betrays this fact. That is who I am. Um, uh, My libertarian beliefs are kind of central to the way that I look at a lot of things. And so, yes, uh, that is a part of the show. I receive many emails. I I do receive a lot of emails about this from non-libertarians telling me that they don't care about those episodes. Uh, that get into classical liberal or libertarian thought. And then on the other hand, I get a ton of emails from libertarians telling me that they're super happy that there exists a libertarian podcast that actually pays attention to the Western classics. So I guess my advice for non-political people who just want to listen to the episodes uh, that focus on the sort of chronological canon stuff is, hey, just listen to those episodes. You know, if you're not interested in the Liberty Lounge segment that I do, you know, then... That's your choice. Don't don't listen to those episodes. Um, it seems like the libertarians out there really like my libertarian episodes, uh, and that my non-political listenership likes it when I do uh, the more literary analyses. Um, so, anyways, and yeah, um, one thing I, I do want to say is it is extremely important to me to keep this podcast heterodox. Of course, since I'm a libertarian and I'm interested in the history of liberty, we have that segment and I do approach things. You'll probably see my libertarian bias. Um, I'm not ashamed of that and I I won't try to uh, suppress myself in that way. Um, that said, I respect people from all sides of the political spectrum. Um, I like talking to people uh, in all different places on the political spectrum. Um, 
I have definitely had more liberal guests on uh, than libertarian or even conservative. People like Emily Wilson and Daniel Mendelson and uh, Diane Arnson Svarlian and Edith Hall, who describes herself as a Marxist um, uh, type of sort of progressive liberal, that sort of thing. Um, and many of the other guests that I've had on um, have been liberal. And so... Um, yeah, to me, it really doesn't matter when it comes to guests, unless I'm talking about liberty, which is a sort of kind of sorting mechanism, right? Edith Hall is not going to come on and talk about how much she loves Robert Notzik's uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. But that said, when we're talking about Aristotle, Plato, Homer, Euripides, I actually don't don't care at all what my what the politics are, um, what my guests' politics are. Um, what I really care about is that they are good guests, they have interesting things to say, and uh, that they can teach us something. Uh, again, this is a heterodox podcast. I will continue to uh, bring on different people, um, and uh, as long as they have something interesting to say, that's sort of the one criterion. Um, and so thank you, Sarah. Keep listening, and please stay in touch. I really appreciate it. Um, and speaking of my libertarian listeners, here's one from Zach Rofer. Uh, Jordan, I heard your very interesting interview with Tom Woods recently. I thought that your questions were excellent. It sounds like your philosophy students are very lucky to have you as a teacher with your erudition and teaching style. As you may know, Tom Woods is a Rothbardian libertarian, as am I. I appeared on Tom's show a few years ago to introduce the first edition of my book, Busting Myths About the State and the Libertarian Alternative. The Mises Institute has now published the second edition, which is available on Amazon. I wrote this book as a survey course for those who want to understand pure libertarianism. Uh, it's not written in an academic style, but rather is intended to be an easy, punchy, conversational read covering lots of ground uh, and is designed to whet appetites. In any event, I want to bring my book to your attention in case it would be of interest to you or any of your students. Keep up the great work trying to educate the next generation in the principles of liberty, Zach Rofer. Well, hey, Zach, um, thank you for listening to the Western Canon Podcast. I may or may not read your book. I would love to. I'm just so busy. Uh, maybe over the summer. But at least now my listeners know about it. Um, I appreciate the letter, and I am glad that you enjoyed the Tom Woods interview. I know I sure did. Uh, what an interesting guy Tom is, and, and really a friendly, friendly guy. Um, uh, I, In fact, I enjoyed it so much so that I think I will include that interview at the end of this episode uh, so that it will not just be an isolated interview, but it will be included in this episode. So thanks for the note, Zach. Um, please do keep in touch. Um, Okay, Jordan. Episode number six was fantastic. I loved hearing about ancient Greek music, and I'm motivated to learn more about the work that has been done reconstructing it. I am very impressed with the guests you've been getting to come on your show. Not bad for a high school English teacher. Thank you for this podcast, Kurt Wiedenhoft. Well, um, thank you very much, Kurt. I really appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. Um, Yes, the music, ancient Greek music and uh, reconstructing it, that came about solely as um, a consequence of my relationship with Spencer Clavin. Um, I, I met Spencer uh, from listening to uh, his father, Andrew Clavin's podcast, and I saw him uh, speaking uh, on a different podcast. And uh, after I saw him, I reached out to him on Twitter, and he has been a a, um, a guest that has been on the show at this point three times. So I love talking with Spencer. I hope he'll consider coming back on when we do uh, the Bible, when we get to the Bible. Um, Spencer is a really interesting uh, thinker, and um, yeah, I think uh, the musical aspect of ancient uh, Greek tragedy is something that we often overlook and... Um, and again, Kurt, thank you for listening, um, and I appreciate the 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 note. Um, Jordan, I really enjoyed the podcast on the Odyssey. Thank you. It was very enriching. Um, best, Howard Sachs, MD, Washington, D.C. One comment caught my attention. You said something about those on the right not facing the truth about the threat of human-induced climate change. I am a proud liberal now called a conservative. 
Uh, well, ain't that the truth, um, Howard Sachs. I have a deep regard for science and learning. I consider the views on the left about this issue bordering on hysteria, though. Maybe take a listen to some of these fine five-minute videos from the great Prager University on the subject and rethink such comments. Best, keep up your fine work. Well, thank you, uh, Howard. I appreciate your note. Um, even if we disagree, I appreciate you reaching out and uh, and uh, letting me know. And I don't mind when listeners hinge on every detail. That is no problem with me. I will say, um, uh, Howard, that my wife is literally a climate scientist, and um, and uh, she teaches an actual course on climate change. And she did uh, her PhD on sort of the physics um, uh, of climate change and. Uh, Having someone like my wife to walk me through the data and teach teach me about what the greenhouse effect is and how long carbon gets stored in the atmosphere and sort of what the timetables are and what the IPCC reports indicate will be the, the warming trends over the next century. Um, having someone like my wife to, to be able to talk about this with has really clarified my positions on climate change. I do think that um, the planet is warming. I do think that um, humans are contributing to uh, climate change. Um, to what extent? I think different models say different things. Um, and uh, and then, of course, the next question is, and by the way, that is something that most mainstream conservatives are, are pretty much there. They're pretty much at this place where they're saying, even people like Ben Shapiro are saying, yes, of course, it, uh, the science points to the fact that the climate is warming uh, and that it is anthropogenic and the humans are causing this to speed up. Yes, there are natural long-term cycles of climate change. We go through warm periods and ice ages and things like that, but we are causing the planet to warm faster than it would naturally. Um, and so we do have to think about our emissions and things like that. And I think that we can do this from a liberty perspective. Again, most, uh, I wouldn't say most, I don't know the numbers on this, but many mainstream conservatives are at that point. But then the next question is, well, what do we do about it? If the planet is warming and human beings are contributing to climate change, where do we go next? What do we do, right? Um, even my wife was against the Green New Deal, right? Because it, it looked like it was written by, you know, a 10th grader who was given an assignment that said, um, please, in the next 15 minutes, write about your own utopian society and your plan for saving the planet. Um, the Green New Deal uh, proposes you know, to get to carbon zero within a few, within just a few years. And um, that makes no sense because if we get to carbon zero, we will not be able to do things like fly planes um, because we don't have um, commercial fully electric planes. Um, banning cows and banning planes and um, retrofitting every building in the United States over the next couple of years seems like it would be a problem for property rights. Um, seems like it would be a problem for uh, imminent domain. It would be an imminent domain nightmare. Um, it would upend the economy and uh, probably uh, would require... Um, in fact, the, the Green New Deal is basically a blueprint for implementing socialism and using climate change as an excuse. So I don't think that the Green New Deal was a serious plan. I think it was an absurd plan. And I think, uh, you know, any plan that proposes along, that sort of shoves in the document along with uh, sort of a solution to combat climate change, that it's also going to end racism and um and implement a and guarantee every citizen of the United States a job, um, a green job is is uh, is pie in the sky. And uh, if you really take climate change seriously, then this um, this Green New Deal plan was a joke. Um, and and uh, as far as I'm concerned, pushed by ideologues like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, who doesn't know anything uh, about anything, and uh, we need a more serious plan than this. When my PhD uh, climate scientist wife uh, says the plan is ridiculous, the plan's probably uh, ridiculous. Um, so thank you very much, Howard. I appreciate the note, and we probably don't disagree as much as you think we do. Um, but that said, thanks for getting in touch. Okay. Okay, so that's it for the mailbag. 
Oh, by the way, I wanted to take this time to give a shout out to my Patreon uh, patrons. I realize that I am supposed to be giving a shout out to my patrons, each of whom I very much appreciate. So here we have Anka Fritsch, who wrote me a letter uh, that I read earlier, Christian Gierstad, um, Robert Davis, Robin Minovich. So thank you so much for supporting the show. And as promised, we're going to end today's episode with an interview I recently did with Tom Woods. Okay, so Dr. Thomas E. Woods is an American historian, political commentator, author, and podcaster. He's a New York Times best-selling author and has published 12 books, including The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, that's 2004, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization, that's 2005, and Who Killed the Constitution? The Fate of American Liberty from World War I to George W. Bush, co-authored with Kevin Gutzman in 2008. Tom Woods has written extensively on subjects including the history of the United States, Catholicism, contemporary politics, and economics. Um, Although he's not an economist himself, Woods is a proponent of the Austrian School of Economics. He hosts two podcasts, The Tom Woods Show and Contra Krugman. Here he is. Hi, Tom. Thanks for joining the Western Canon Podcast. My pleasure, Jordan. Thank you very much. So I'm really excited to have you uh, on the show. I've been listening to you for years And one of the things I love about the Tom Woods show is that you range from current political events uh, to deep issues of libertarian philosophy to, you know, making it as a podcaster and and those sorts of things. You talk about, you know, what are the best avenues for homeschooling your kids? And, uh, you know, you really come at discussing freedom from all angles. I want to start briefly with your background. Uh, You have a pretty much a non-traditional background, given that you are kind of an academic type. Uh, You're a historian, a New York Times bestselling author, podcast host, uh, and and I would say sort of a firebrand libertarian. Uh, But you aren't a tenured professor. Your path uh, to reaching the public has been self-reliant, Right. Uh, And you talk about that a lot in your show. Um, I wanted to ask about your background. Um, You know, how did you get to where you are now? Uh, Where did you get your education, uh, Tom? And how did you end up in the position that that you're in as a as an influential commentator, uh, as an author, as a podcast host? Well, I have some fairly elite credentials, yet I, I've i sometimes thought to myself that it would be a nice goal to make these elite universities rue the day. <laughs> they let me, <laughs> you know, boast of, of, uh, of uh, you know, have, holding a degree from those places. So I do have a, an undergraduate degree from Harvard in history and several degrees in history from Columbia University. So my educational background is, is in the Ivy League. And I will say that although... The vast bulk of people who taught me were on the left. I mean, maybe I'm generalizing too much, but in my experience at the Ivy League level, there is still a sense that if you do good work, you get rewarded. Now, that's not to say I would ever be appointed to a chair at Harvard, but there, there were serious people there. Like my dissertation director, Alan Brinkley, whose father was the newsman David Brinkley, was an expert on American conservatism. So we had plenty to talk about, and we disagreed, but it was an interesting conversation, and we respected each other. And I, I, what I'm describing to you sounds like it's from another galaxy. <laughs> the, the people with different views were able to sit down and have, have pleasant conversations, but I, I invited uh, numerous professors out to lunch and uh, chatted with them in their office hours. There, there was a bit of conformity, let's say, on campus, but absolutely nothing like it is today. Right. I, I just dread setting foot on a college campus. That's these days. right. But so, so you're right. I, 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 so I, I did go this path. I did dip my toe into academia briefly, but then when I got a position as a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, and I spent four years there, I realized, well, I actually rather like the the job where I wake up in the morning and I do whatever I want to do. I basically work on whatever I want to work on. This is absurd. And on my way to the office, I would drive by people who were doing roofing in 100-degree Alabama heat and say, this is not something to take lightly or to fail to appreciate. Right. But what got me on my current path was in 2010, 
for family reasons, we wound up relocating. And I thought, well, that's okay. I can work from anywhere, and I'll just freelance in terms of writing and speaking. But my gosh, I mean, eventually we wound up with five children, and, and just writing and speaking is a pretty precarious existence for a father in that position. That's right. So I began doing a little online teaching and stuff like that. But I realized that in writing the books I had written, and at this point I've written a dozen of them, I had built up an audience that enjoyed content of mine. And somebody advised me that if they like your books, maybe they would like to see you teach. Maybe you could teach history courses. So I started to do that online. I built my own platform for that. And I taught the way I built it was the history and economics they didn't teach you. <laughs> and suddenly I had a lot of people banging down my door to enroll in that. And, I've, and that's now seven years ago that I launched that thing. 2012 was when I launched that thing. And then I started working on the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum, which is a K through 12 program that kind of supplements what I've been doing for adult enrichment for adults. And that has been great. It's a self-taught curriculum. I promote that. And 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 following up on that, I realized that I I got pretty good promoting that thing. Mm -hmm. And and I realized, you know, I can promote. I'm just good at promoting, period. I mean, if there's something that's worthwhile that will help my folks, I'm pretty good at promoting it. So, for example, on my podcast, I do have some sponsors. And I have sponsors who have been with me for years. And you would think by now all my listeners have made their decision. They're either going to buy this razor or they're not. Right. But it's that – I'm just good at it. I guess that's <laughs> something I didn't realize before. And so now I'm in a position where because I am pretty good as a marketer and I have you know, built up some pretty decent entrepreneurial instincts, I get to interview people every single weekday whom I find interesting and I promote things that I believe in deeply that I, that I think will help my folks like the Ron Paul curriculum. And I get to more or less make my own hours. Sometimes they're – Sometimes they could be long hours depending on what I'm working on, but I, I can work from anywhere. If I just decide, you know, I need to get out of town for a few days, I can pack up my computer and go. That's right. It doesn't matter. No, I yeah. don't have to say, get anybody's permission, you know, hey, may I please do this? So that is not a position I would want to give up no matter what was offered to me in academia. I just wouldn't want to do it because not only that, I have a much, much bigger audience than I would ever have in academia. Much, much bigger. True. True. And I imagine that allows you to be more of a purist, however, than someone in academia would would uh, be capable of. I wanted to ask you about your your brand of libertarianism. I've been listening to your show for a while, and so I kind of know. But for my listeners, um, I, I wanted to ask you about you know the type of libertarian you are. As a libertarian myself, I come into contact with many different varieties of libertarianism based on whatever I'm listening to. Some that don't seem very much like libertarianism at all, right? Often these are like left-wing types that for some reason want to say they're libertarian, uh, uh, you know, but uh, really they're just left-wing. Uh, and even kind of the right-wing interventionist types who are afraid to admit that they are conservatives or uh, neocons or whatever. Uh, and so they cling on to the libertarian label. And then there are different strains of libertarian thought. There's Cato and there's Mises, um, small L libertarians and, and anarcho-capitalists, right? There are a bunch of different strains. Lay out your philosophy for my listeners. Um, how would you describe your, your worldview, Tom? Well, I'll say two things, the first of which will be less controversial among libertarians. And the first thing is when I started studying economics and then eventually I moved on to the so-called Austrian school, what impressed me about it was that and I realize it's not fashionable to say this, it is self-regulating. It shows how society operates without a central voice directing it, without, I call it the bullhorn theory of society, that things don't get done unless somebody with a bullhorn is barking out orders of people. <clears throat> and yet you have this amazing international division of labor with no central coordination churning out products at, at just the right pace. So there are, there's no surplus, there are no shortages, and all this is coordinated across an international span with people who probably can't stand the sight of each other, for all I know. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow this amazing cornucopia results. That, that demands explanation. That demands gratitude. It demands wonder. It should prompt these things in us. And when you try to intervene in it, you think you're going to improve it you know, because you're – we're smart people. Surely we can produce a better outcome than people operating at random, but you can't, it turns right. out. And it's, it's, it's hubris even to try. So that gives me this inclination to say, let 
you know, let people interact with each other freely, and that gives us the best result. The other side of this is where I sometimes come up against uh, uh, opposition among among other libertarians. And the nice thing is these other libertarians and I don't talk to each other, so it never <laughs> – doesn't really bother me <laughs> at all. But and, and it's not even that I'm unwilling to speak to people who disagree with me. The the funny thing is I get people saying on my show, they'll sometimes people will say to me, my listeners, um, you know, you should interview people who aren't just libertarians. So okay, so I'll bring a diverse array of people on and they'll say, Hey, those people aren't libertarians. I can't <laughs> satisfy you people, right? So I'm quite willing to talk to folks. But but the other thing is my view is that the state I think a lot of people who think of themselves as conservative or on the right, they think of the state as being a guarantor of order and the state as a guarantor of social order and that uh, you know we need the state to crack down on X, Y, or Z. And I think to the contrary, that for at least the past couple of hundred years, the state is the source of disorder. Mm-hmm. Not, not the only source, but it's a source. It's an institutional source, and it's a source that everybody from kindergarten on up is taught to revere and trust. And that's very dangerous. So I believe if your view is, look, I'm, I'm conservative. I believe in what Russell Kirk called the permanent things. Mm-hmm. I just want what's best for my family. I, I, I believe in – I have very traditional beliefs on a wide array of, of topics. Then the state is not ever in the modern world. It's not ever going to be your friend. Maybe temporarily you can get some legislation that slightly helps the family 3 percent. But after that, the state will be back to its war on everything you believe in. And so my view is that instead of saying, well, we'll capture the reins of it, and we'll show them, is to try to work toward a society where we regulate uh, the social order, let's say, um, just through the normal operation of civil society, non-coercively, and try to think that way because I think it's a, it's a devil's bargain to try to be working with an institution that when you have people who hate your guts in charge of it, can really, really make your life miserable, borderline impossible. Right. So, so is your um, libertarianism informed by human nature, by the fact that um, human beings, when they are in charge of anything, are, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely and that sort of thing? Are you a believer in subsidiarity? I am. I mean, subsidiarity taken to the nth degree. Now, I know folks on your well, who listen to you, they'd be insulted if I defined what subsidiarity is, but I'm going to anyway you should, at the, yeah. risk, the risk of insulting them because that's a word that doesn't get used often enough. The idea behind it, and I guess it – I mean really you can see it going back into the Middle Ages, but in the 20th century it did get a little bit of extra uh, attention. The idea is that we don't simply assign to a faraway institution the care of a particular task. Unless we've first exhausted all local possibilities. Right. So, so we begin first with the family and then with the local neighborhood and then maybe the local parish or civic groups or some, some kind of a fraternal organization. And then, you know, then at the extreme, you know, at, this is an extremely difficult problem, maybe the county. <laughs> and then if it's unthinkable, then we go to the state level. Mm-hmm. And then if it's just you – know, so in other words, you, it's, it's a series of levels. And we don't delegate to a higher level of society unless all other options have been exhausted. And it's my view that they're never exhausted. They're right. basically never. It's just right. automatically assumed. Well, of course, Hillary Clinton and and, and uh, Lindsey Graham need to tell us about how our school should operate or <laughs> what our university should be teaching. And I, I think that's got the way society should run exactly backwards. That's right. And so power should be nested at the lowest levels possible. Does that start with the individual? Is the lowest rung the individual and then the family and then the county and then the state and then the, you know, the federal government? And should the federal government just be worrying about protecting our individual natural rights? Well, even there, the uh, there are some libertarians who would say that we want a federal government whose court system is going to look out for individual liberty and intervene where necessary around the country to enforce that. I tend to think that that too is too top down, that if, if, in, if we have a, a government of any kind at any level, then we want the most local level to be the first one we look right. to when it comes to the protection of individual rights because it sounds – it sounds saccharine and benign. Oh, look, we're just here to protect your individual rights. We don't in any way intend to uh, criminalize behavior or speech. Uh, we're not here to, to, to cast a pall over free speech or free thought or how you run your business. But as long as we're here, maybe we will. 
I, I would rather not put that that nose in that particular tent. Do you think that that's what's happening with Brexit? Is the idea that that uh, the European Union, which claims to uh, respect subsidiarity, is that sort of the problem? Is that power is centralized far away in, in such a way that uh, Britain can't make its own laws? Right. I mean, that is the problem. And of course, they may say that they believe in subsidiarity, but a lot of people say a lot of things. I mean, when you looked at the the Soviet Constitution, that made an awful lot of promises. <laughs> That were the exact yeah. opposite of Soviet life. Mm -hmm. So when I see this controversy over Brexit, I, I understand people who are simply technocrats in the way they look at the world saying, well, there might be some mild inconveniences uh, if they're with Brexit because then we're not part of this, this uh, common economy as much anymore. And so I might need more documentation when I travel around or there are different taxes I might be subject to. I, I sort of – I see that. But – to think that you would be against – when I hear somebody saying, I need – we need to remain. I'm totally against Brexit. This is the end of the world. What I hear them saying is, I don't want us making our own decisions. I'm not smart enough for that. I need you smarty pants people telling us what we should be doing. That, that just seems like beneath the dignity of a free people to put yourself in that position. Do you think that a, a lot of the uh, sort of attempts to centralize everything um, – and sort of ignore subsidiarity have to do with the misunderstanding of rights. Do you think that it that people don't realize what rights are? If you want to think about it in the context of positive versus negative rights, is one of the problems is that we we think that positive rights here in the United States at this point, maybe it's a, a civics education problem. We think that positive rights are actually natural rights, which they aren't. I think certainly this fuels centralization because the language of rights is very compelling to us, especially as Americans. The language of rights, I have a right to this uh, and, and you have a right to that and my rights are being violated. So when that language gets used, we sit up and take notice. And the trouble is, as you say, if you just promiscuously use the language of rights, you lead to all kinds of confusion. And the language of rights, which was intended to protect us against government overreach, can then be used as empowering the government. Because, of course, if you have a right to, well, a laundry list of, of goods, well, how, are you, how is that going to happen unless the state is involved? Whereas at least, it's at least conceivable that your right to your life – your right to your property, your right to life, uh, to, to liberty. These things could conceivably, you could at least imagine how they could work just with plain old civil society. Because my right to life really means, it doesn't mean I have a right to a kidney dialysis machine. Right. It really means I have a right not to be killed by you. That's right. My right to property doesn't mean you're obligated to give, give me property. Right. It means the property I have, I have a right not to have it stolen. So these are really negative, so-called negative rights. Right. And now, that's that's one thing, and I can imagine how we could arrange that. But if you're going to say to me that you have a right to a Cadillac, how could that happen in civil society? Because at least I could imagine my, you know, we all have a right to property, you enjoying your property, me enjoying my property, and it works. But if you have a right to a Cadillac, well, so do I. So <laughs> now how is that going to be enforced? Are we going to both go over to the Cadillac dealership and just steal them from the guy? In which case, where's his right to a Cadillac? Right. How does that come into play? Right. These don't even make sense. They can't even be enforced consistently because if I were, if you and I were on a desert island and I tried to enforce my right to a Cadillac against you, what would that consist of? Me enslaving you, forcing you to make a Cadillac yes. for me. Yes. So there's no way that can be a natural right. The idea of nature is that it's constant across place and time. Right. But if that right can't be enforced on a desert island or it couldn't be enforced 500 years ago, then it's not natural. Then right. it's invented by somebody. And it's probably uh, some scheme to empower the state further because the state then has to intervene. That's why the state loves the idea of equality because equality, which in some, in some, sem in some semblances can be an okay idea, right? Mm -hmm. We all are equal before the law or we know equality we're all – Equality of rights. Yeah, that's right. We're all equally entitled uh, to be free from uh, interference by other people. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But that word, there's something captivating about it. Then it can be used to mean, well, everybody has an equal right to this or that or an equal right to and, – and before you know it, it means kids are being bussed for two hours a day for, to, for their equal right to a particular kind of education. And then it turns out the very students who were supposed to be helped by that, it's their parents saying, please stop doing this. 
this is insanity. Why are we doing this? The god of equality is very difficult to satiate. And, That's right. and the state knows that it will require constant intervention. So, for instance, the, the classic example that um, – oh, now what's his name? Robert Nozick gave in his book um, – Anarchy, State, and Utopia. He says, take Wilt Chamberlain, you know, the old basketball legend. And he says, now, let's imagine we all start at an equal material level. We all have absolutely equal possessions. But then one day we all want to go see Wilt Chamberlain play basketball. So everybody pays 25 cents to Wilt Chamberlain to watch him play basketball. Now, instantly, equality has been disrupted. And now Wilt Chamberlain is super rich. So now what is the idea then? Is Wilt Chamberlain now re required to give everybody their money back? Well, then <laughs> – so in other words, right. he's supposed to play basketball for free. So instantly, the very first transaction, we've upset equality. Right. So if you're going to re enforce equality in its most radical meanings, it requires constant social management, right. which is precisely what people with PhDs who think they know how to run people's lives better than they themselves do, this is what they're trained to do, right. is manage society. And the idea, the liberating idea that maybe society could manage itself, it's no wonder these people – go out of their way to ridicule and demonize that idea. That's so simple and simplistic. Why, you need us ruling over you. I'm not so sure I do. That's what my show is all about. I like that Notzik uses the example of, you know, uh, t taking taxation and uh, economic liberty and sort of reframing the issue and saying, well, if we have to make everything equal, do you guys agree that we should that we should have uh, marriage equality in the sense that um, if you're born unattractive, uh, some woman is forced to marry you, right? And he, and he right. just shifts that over there. Oh, yeah. Or, or there's been um, the example – because they'll say uh, we can redistribute things because they have all reasons why they can The Rawlsian notion of yeah. cosmic injustice. Well, right. And you're not – like even if you have a talent, you're not entitled to the fruits <laughs> of that talent. If, you, if you're a great chess player, you're not really entitled to that. And so what, it, what, what they think follows from that is, therefore, we can take your stuff, which doesn't really follow. So, so they'll, they'll, or they'll even say – and even if you say, but it took a lot of hard work for me to really cultivate this talent, they'll say the inclination toward hard work is also something you don't deserve. <laughs> and so one of the um, arguments that's been used to, to really make them think through the real logic of this is, let's suppose you're blind and I have two functioning eyes. Now, I don't strictly deserve to have two functioning eyes. I could, there but for the grace of God go I, I could just as easily have been blind. So supposing that the biology could work this way, what is there to stop the idea that, uh, some, that they should be able to take one of my functioning eyes and give it to the blind man? Because after all, I'll still be able to see. It's, it's not, you know, that, I mean, it's an inconvenience, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas this guy goes from no sight at all to being sighted. So why shouldn't people be able to take body parts even from other people to equalize things. You realize once you start going down this path and it leads you to absurd conclusions that maybe the first step you took down the path was absurd. Right. And the way I explain positive versus negative rights to students is I say, you know, a negative right is your right from being messed with. Yeah. You don't have a right to health care, right? Uh, South Africa has a right to health care in their constitution, but do they have a health care system that works? Declaring things rights doesn't just magically make them appear, right? Um, and, I, and I tell my students, I try to pick an issue that they would find ludicrous. And I say, imagine the Second Amendment, imagine that were a positive right. That would mean that the government has the responsibility of furnishing every American with a firearm. Do you think that that even makes sense? Universally, no, that's wacko. Right? You have a right to purchase, to enter the free market and purchase a firearm. And that's how all of the uh, the rights contained within the Bill of Rights work. Yeah, exactly. That's what they are, by and large. I wanted to shift a little bit. I've been on a lock notesick kick lately, and I do consider myself a Lockean natural rights guy. And one question that I've been asking myself, although I don't feel I have the historical background to answer my own question, is Locke's impact on the American founders. Um, I teach a high school philosophy class, uh, two sections of it, and I spend a long time on Locke's natural rights. Uh, to what extent do you think Locke's work influenced the founders, influenced the founding fathers? Um, were people like Jefferson and Madison reading Locke? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they were extremely widely read. Uh, so they had, they had read 
the the major thinkers and some thinkers who today we would think to be minor thinkers, but were major thinkers in their day, like Algernon Sidney or uh, well Montesquieu was a major Montesquieu. figure at, at, at any time. But they were very familiar with this, and obviously you do see Lockean language coming out of Jefferson, so they're they're quite familiar uh, with him. And the thing is, there has actually been a controversy among American historians that's raged for probably half a century about the extent to which the American Revolution and the American Founding Fathers should be thought of first as liberals in the classical Lockean sense, not obviously not the Hillary Probably. Clinton sense, or should they be thought first and foremost as Republicans, so that they they think of uh, you know a self governing society and 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 this and that and virtue and all that and 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 so what the Republican school had been trying to do for a long time was to downplay the role of Locke and say that that's not really the central thrust, but my sense is that the Lockeans are starting to get the upper hand in this uh, in this conversation. So I don't see what the point is of of denying the centrality of Locke unless you have an agenda. Right. And I think typically the agenda is people realize that – I mean this is one of the cases, as Murray Rothbard said, that in which the idea of Locke as being basically a classical liberal who was – you know. A, Pretty close to libertarianism. In, in fact, uh, I, uh, Simmons is his last name. I can't remember. It might be John Simmons. A biographer or a, a scholar of Locke has a book called something like On the Edge of Anarchy, arguing that that's just how much of a minimal government guy Locke was. And Rothbard says, all right, the conventional wisdom actually has Locke correct. That is who he was. That is what he believed. So there are plenty of American um, thinkers who would prefer to believe that American society does not owe anything to Locke, right? You'd, you'd rather grasp for any other influence on the Founding Fathers other than Locke. So I personally think that's what was driving that, that debate. But we're so incredibly Lockean. I mean, even if you take life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you get the sense that, of course, Jefferson was modeling uh, this off of um, – you know uh, the sort of philosophy of happiness in in the United States, and I know that he uh, the founding fathers were working off of different state constitutions and things like that. But the idea, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, is is that you need property rights to to pursue happiness in the first place. That's a a lot of people have argued it precisely that way, and once you give it some thought, you, you realize how difficult it is to deny that. And the thing is, even the even the communists would would say you could have your own toothbrush. You know, like they, right. they wouldn't say that the whole neighborhood owns your toothbrush. Like right. even they have some standards. But beyond that, the idea that you could own land. Right. You could actually own land and work that land and be entitled to the fruits of that of that land. Right. Now we're getting now we're starting to get into what seems like common sense to you and me, but in these debates would be considered controversial. Right. And, and in fact, it was Rousseau who said that the first person who stood his ground on some plot of land and said, this is mine, became responsible for all the violence ever in the history of the world. <laughs> but, but the problem with that is we have, each, each of us, we basically have potentially unlimited desires. Right. Because you know, in principle – I'd like to have a uh, prime rib every single day and I'd like to go on a cruise every week and I'd like to you know maybe I would like all these things or I would like to have a gardener and a personal chef and a driver and all these things the trouble is just the mathematics of it mean that if I'm employing 5 people not everybody can employ 5 people where are all the people going to come from so in other words there's a limit to how how many of my desires can be satisfied so and, and in other words, we have scarcity. We have only so much land. Mm -hmm. We have only so many resources, only so much of this and that and the other. And so there has to be some way where – and we all want we all want to live on the coast and we all want this and that. There has to be some peaceful way by which we resolve this, and property is the only one that I can see that makes intuitive sense to people and – you know, can be universally applied without contradiction. So, I mean, I've I've had episodes in my show where I've gone through and explained why this is actually the best possible arrangement, uh, and and that's what Locke <clears throat> is fundamentally about is property, and and that's what the the framers are are thinking of. And of course, I mean, even think about how difficult it is when the state is you know basically the owner of the means of production, and 
can therefore, if it wants to, keep out of your hands the things you would need to mount a resistance if right. it came to that. Right. So h- how are you going to own your own newspaper when they have all the means of production? Right. How, you know, how are you going to make photocopies if they're not going to let you have a copy machine? You know, you have to sm- – so basically, people smuggled stuff into the Soviet Union. They, you know, videotapes and whatever things that showed them what life was like outside the Soviet Union that undermined the system. But they themselves, on their own, it was very, very difficult to coordinate resistance because they couldn't, they couldn't own the wherewithal that you would need to to mount the resistance. Right. My the thing that my students and I work with, you know, high school uh, sophomores and juniors and seniors. The thing that they always have a problem with is they do not understand fundamentally how you can have a right before government gives it to you. Do, you know, they they ask me, yeah, but how could you have a right that is objective without the government first giving it to you? And I have to explain to them, look, you first have to believe that things are true. There's a lot of moral relativism going on. Think about what it even means to be a human person. What it means to be a human person is that you have a right to your own life. The definition, so I'm trying to explain to them how the right to your own life is deductive from the fact that you're even a human. The definition of a human, like tautologically, is that you exist over time as a person. You're not a human unless you exist and retain your identity over time. Yeah. Right. And so if you do, if we can even acknowledge that there's such a thing as a person, then you must have a right to your own life. And if you have a right to your own life, you have a right to your own body. And if you have a right to your own body, then you have a right to your own labor. And if you have a right to your own labor, then you have a right to the fruits of your labor. And if you have a right to the the, fruits of... What was the problem? Was the problem that they were saying that that we couldn't cons- – we wouldn't come up with the idea. It wouldn't be consistent across people unless the government stated it to us or is it that no, it's we'd, the have the, we'd have the rights but they wouldn't be secure? Well, it, it, they, they actually believe that there, there could not objectively be a thing in a state of nature like a right. Like, like who's giving it to us? Now, I know you can go the God route and do like Locke does and say that you're God's property, of course, and then so it would be morally wrong to violate uh, – you know, uh, God's property rights. But the thing that I'm trying to explain to them from a secular point of view is that what it even means to be a person and what, what it means for rights to be self-evident is that if you're going to be an isolated person that exists over time, you have to have a right to your own existence so that all of the other rights spring from forth from the right to life. Using your well, reason, you, you can come to you, this. Or you could even, if you really are having trouble, you could you could try and reverse it and say, all right, if, if my having a right is difficult for you to conceive of in the state of nature, then think of it this way. Because, uh, by the way, Locke's view was that in this – it was not that in the state of nature we have no rights. We do have we rights. We do have we rights, just, of course. We just enjoy them precariously. Right. Whereas the Hobbesian view was that basically anything goes, nobody has anything in the right. state of and nature. Right, and then you need well, the Locke Leviathan that to keep us in check. So, right. Right. So it was not that the government was granting us anything. It was recognizing – and the idea, at least, exactly. was that it was going to protect more effectively rights we already had. Right. Now, you, but you could say to those students, all right, if you feel funny saying, I have a right, then I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I'll simply say that in that state of nature, you ha- I agree with you. You have no right to assault me. You have no right to take myself because you would have to justify that. I mean what, what I find interesting is that they would feel like they can't justify a right to their own life. But all right. Then let's start if, – if your problem is you have trouble justifying rights, then let's start with ones we can all agree on. You couldn't justify your right to steal from me. You couldn't right, justify your right – and so I would start with that and say you certainly don't have these offensive rights. But are you really going to say that you wouldn't have some kind of right to stay alive, to well, appropriate to yourself things that keep you right. in existence? And I do say that, and, and the thing with – you know. You have, a, you, kinda, you have a right to swing your fist until the other person's nose begins. I do tell them that every right comes with a corresponding duty, right? That, that if you're a person, so are they, and they have the same rights that you do, right, necessarily. Um, I think that it has – I think it's a bit of a moral relativism thing, the idea that they can't even imagine how it is the case that your rights are objective such that when governments are formed, they're formed to protect those rights. And that's when I, I have to get – even deeper and start talking about there are a priori truths like two plus two equals four. Then there are a posteriori truths like truths of the natural sciences. And the way I explain it to them, and you may disagree with this, but this is how I come at it, is I say that 
that natural rights are anthropocentric truths. They're truths that are true because of the kinds of creatures we are, right? Which is, I tell the students, you know, you watch National Geographic and there's a lion ripping apart a gazelle, right? You don't get outraged about it because they don't have the same rights that you do, right? Animals are free to rape each other in nature. They don't have the same rights that you do and that you have the kinds of rights that you do because of the kinds of creatures that we as human beings are. And that starts to get them understanding how there can be such a thing as a reasoned based claim for the idea that there are natural rights that precede government. Yeah. Also the fact that we are capable of language, right? What purpose? Now I'm old fashioned. I, <laughs> I think things have purposes. Me too. A telos, you know, how about that? Right. Yeah. Things have purposes. What would be the purpose of language if not to foster cooperation mm -hmm. between people? Very good, yeah. I mean, if, if I want to kill you, I don't have to tell you that I'm going to do it. Right. <laughs> I can just do it. But if but if you and I are going to build a skyscraper, we're going to need to talk this over. That's right. So that, that alone should say to you, we need to be building a society in which we have institutions that foster the cooperation. Mm -hmm. And may, namely, that just means if you could stop punching me in the face, that <laughs> would be nice. You know, that's just... You really just need a bare minimum of, of, of mutual recognitions. And, and I, I'm surprised to hear that your students level that uh, objection because I don't generally come across students who are even thinking at that level. Mostly they're thinking, I, uh, I have a right to do whatever I want to do. I mean, basically, we're going, it's like the Beastie Boys. You know, they, they, they want to fight to their, for their right to party. That's right. about the level that my students were at. And so the idea that they would uh, question whether that they'd have these rights in the state of nature, this thought would not – dawn on them but then they'll turn around and say but if a majority vote says i don't have this right anymore then you know what who am i to say oh you were doing so well i know <laughs> and that's when i say appeal to popularity fallacy right and and i do say things to them like you know your claim that that uh that morality is completely subjective makes it s such that you can't say that hitler was an evil guy you can't say that anymore you are not allowed to say that because who are you to say Right? Who are you to make that case? Who are you to say? Right? And so I'm kind of a Kantian a little bit in that sense. And you brought up stealing earlier. And I'll tell them, look, if you universalize stealing, there can be no such thing as personal property. And if there's no such thing as personal property, then there could be no such thing as stealing. Stealing is morally wrong objectively. And so, but, but as you said, most teenagers aren't thinking that way. I do teach an ad, advanced uh Math and Science Academy Charter School. I teach at the second best uh, public school in the state of Massachusetts. So these kids are just all over everything. I didn't know. Well, after we go off the air, I want to ask you where you are because because uh, I I'm from there and I want to. I'm just curious. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. even know that. I, I grew up in North Andover. Oh, wow! Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We have I, to talk. This is one of the best charter schools in the entire country. Top top twenty or something like that. Um, so of course they they do ask me the hard questions and and uh, but I wanted that's to ask fun yeah it, it's a lot of fun yeah. I love debating yeah. with those kids um, I wanted to ask how you come at property rights do you subscribe to labor theory of property do you subscribe to the idea that you know if you mix your labor with the land that you have a right in a state of nature to appropriate property and then you know of course that your money is your property and your body is your property and the fruits of your labor, that's your property right, as well. Right, the Lockean uh, interpretation. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm inclined to state it more along the lines, uh, coming at it with Hans Hoppe, of a first user principle. So, I mean, generally we're not in a state where there's a lot of, of never owned land, right? right? But, but let's say we extend back into the, the mists of time and we have a lot of uh, property that's unowned. How does it come to be owned is the question. Mm -hmm. And – this is precisely the question I was kind of implicitly driving at before, which is in order to minimize conflict in society or, or to obviate uh, co conflict altogether, we have to figure out a way to decide who gets to use a particular thing because there may be many more people who want to use it than there are its to be used. Mm -hmm. So how do we decide that? And And you could think of a lot of different ways. You could think of just, okay, verbal declaration. I just declare that to be my thing. But then what would happen? Everyone would just start shouting, and then, well, who said it first, and who was the right. loudest? And So that can't really work. And so when you start to think, well, what if we said, what if we said the fifth person? Or, or no, what if we said everybody, everybody equally has a, has a stake in that particular use of that thing? 
Well, then that would mean, given that ownership means dis being able to decide how a thing is disposed of, then who could use it? You'd have to get the consent of every living person. We'd all be dead <laughs> before we could use anything. So that if my, the Woods rule is, if a, if a if an approach to to society would lead to the extinction of the human race, it can be ruled out. Right. That's Kantian. So, That's very Kantian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Because it would be. Yeah. It would. We would. If we try to universalize it, and we're all dead. <laughs> Not good. Exactly. So so, what about the first user of a thing? That's at least something we can all see. This person's the first user, and. And that at least, that gives us a way of, say, of of assigning. All right, this person now has some kind of sovereignty over this particular thing mm -hmm. by virtue of being the first user, and then he can hand it on. Whatever. Because I mean, we even know instinctively. Well, I had it first. Gives you some kind of claim, but you may say, well, it's morally arbitrary to be the first one. Why not the fifth one? Well, here's why not the fifth one, because if it has to be, if it's that the fifth one can get to use it, so then what? The first four people. What happens? None of them can exercise it. So if it's grapes, I can't actually eat the grapes because I'm the first one. We have to wait for the fifth guy to come along. I, I mean, there's no way for that ever to work. So when you, in other words, with, with Hoppe's outlook, you pretty much rule out all other possibilities because it can't be joint ownership because you would never be able to get the consent of everybody on a practical level to ever be able to put your ownership into practice. And so the, the only thing that's left is first user, which typically does mean a kind of homesteading process uh, where, you know, you, because a homesteader in Locke's view is a first user. Right. Uh, because you don't have to home If you're the 58th user, it's been handed down or sold and nobody even knows who the first user was. In Locke's view, you don't have to keep homesteading it forever. Uh, you don't have to keep, to, you know, at that point, you can just enjoy the beauty of it if you mm -hmm. want. And you're the rightful owner. So does there have to be um, enough and as good left in common, and do you have to mix your labor with the land such uh. that the land's an extension <laughs> of, your, of your body and, the, and your exertions and your time, which is your property just as well as your body is? What do you think about that? I'm not sure well, how I feel yeah, completely about these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the Lockean proviso, as much and as good left for others. Now, my wing of libertarianism does not really like the Lockean proviso. Okay. <laughs> and also, um, the introduction, and I believe Locke gets into this at some point, the introduction in society of money helps to resolve some of his concerns, which would be that if somebody's got all this excess property and you know he's, got, he's produced stuff that just spoils and goes to waste, right. but – with a money economy, you can have freedom of exchange and all these sorts of things get resolved. I'm not sure that uh, that yeah I, I don't I just I don't go for the lock in proviso, but I don't think I can give you a pithy response. I'd have to sure. write it out. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. In one of your recent episodes, you talked about the social contract, and I thought it was such a great episode. You went through all of these different um, uh, uh, rebuttals to the social contract. Tom, do we live within or must we obey a social contract? What are your thoughts on this? I think the existence of social contract thinking is an attempt by people who believe in the state. And there are people who believe in the state and they just want it to do a few small things. And there are others who want full on social engineering via the state. But what they have in common is they want to justify the state. They, they don't want it to seem like this is just a bunch of thieves taking your stuff. They want to say the this is categorically different. The stationary people, bandit. Right, exactly. And so the way they do they, – they, they, the thing is they absolutely do not want to have to bring themselves to say uh, that the, – they don't want to state the brute fact that you are being ruled. What they want to say is you consented to this. So in a way, <laughs> it's kind of like you ruling yourself. I mean they <laughs> – and I think this comes out of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment does not want to talk about – some people rule and other people are rule. They want to talk um, uh, more about consent. Um, and, and there's a lot of great stuff that comes out of that with consent. I mean I think a, a, a society of contract is better than a society of status. Mm -hmm. I think that is an improvement. But that meant that they had to make society itself into like a contract because that was a model that they used for thinking about all other human relations. So society must be like a contract. But then they look at it. And most of them admit, all right, well, the, 
it never actually turned out like that. Like they never really was there a case where people got together and all agreed to something. So we have to then come up with some way we can say that it's almost like you did that. Or in certain hypothetical situations, we know you would have done that. Or by virtue of some of the actions you're taking, you have more or less done that. And they've got to cling to this. <laughs> I don't remember case, signing a contract. Exactly. In every case, it's always a more or less or it's kind of like or it's it, – and, and it's like they never – you never hear somebody argue this weakly uh, for other <laughs> for other things. It's clearly because they want it to come out this way. And you know who did sign a contract? The only person I can think of who did sign a contract were people who agreed to fo- uphold the principles of the Constitution, right? Our leaders, right? They, they call the Constitution the rule that governs our rulers, the law that right. governs our lawmakers. They actually do sign a social contract probably, right? Yeah, you would think so. I mean, and and this is one of the reasons that that it's it's difficult to credit social contract theory because a contract is supposed to be by definition mutual. Mutual. So your point just now that implicitly at least that they've they've signed something. I mean, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they 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 swear to uphold the Constitution. So you would think this would be a mutual arrangement <laughs> that yes, we have our responsibilities toward the state. We got to pay our taxes and obey the laws. But they then have to fulfill their side of the bargain, which is they have to protect us from crime and from foreign invasion and whatever else they, they say they do. The Green New Deal. <laughs> right. Whatever whatever it is. <laughs> but even, us but from let's, that. But, but let's make it more difficult on me. So like don't give me an easy one like the Green New Deal. Let's, let's say uh, protect me from crime because that seems unobjectionable. I would like to be protected from crime. But the trouble is that you can't enforce against them any kind of judgment that they have failed in their side of the bargain. That's if you true. don't pay your taxes, you're going to prison. Right. But if they don't uphold their side, and then they'll come back and say, "Well, nobody's perfect. We, you know, nobody could could catch every criminal." But I, in that episode, I gave the example of a famous court case from 1975, which has been repeated numerous times since then, in which it was clearly shown that the state had been grossly negligent in protecting three women from an attack grossly absurdly negligent but the ruling was the state has no obligation to protect any particular person it has an obligation to provide a general umbrella of protection but it has no obligation to any individual then by by the definition of any contract by any contract standards that we have in any other aspect of society it would be instantly invalidated Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think that's probably the importance of the declaration of independence and the second amendment and the idea that if the state promises that they have signed this contract and they're going to protect our natural rights and they fail to, it's our job to pick up our guns. Well, that is ultimately in the last resort what people are supposed to do. And you, you know, this, that rarely works out well. And it worked out well in the American case. But it worked out, it was so surprising to people that George Washington just laid down his arms and went home that you know it is it is true the king of england says it uh, he, he truly is the greatest man in the world but you sometimes know, it works no one right does that. sometimes it works uh, like the whiskey rebellion is a good example of at least something coming out of that right the the uh this was an armed uprising against the federal government that's you know, true it was eventually put down but it but it but it led to the repeal of the whiskey tax and the yeah, election right. of jefferson, jefferson when he over, got in he did get rid of, yeah that's over true adams yeah yeah and then what 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 was interesting was that Although the Whiskey Rebellion took place in uh, western Pennsylvania, the the resistance to the whiskey tax was much more extensive than – it was not confined to western Pennsylvania. A lot of the backcountry areas were resisting it, and there th- th- it just seemed so hopeless to try to fight them that they just more or less looked the other way, and these mm-hmm. people just got away with not paying. Nobody wanted to be a, a, a tax collector in that area, right. so it just went undone. That's my kind of resistance That's where right. the public – is so on board with something that they and, – and in a way, it, I wouldn't say that the model is precisely the same, but the way the homeschooling movement began to flourish, it, I mean that was not exactly encouraged by our cultural betters, let's say, right. Right, whose job it is to educate us and, and tell us what to think. And for parents who said, you know, in this particular situation, I think I could do a better job, this was not uh, anything that was encouraged. It was positively discouraged. But when enough people said we're doing it, well, what are you going to do? Roll in the tanks? At some point, 
something simply becomes a fait accompli, right. and the regime has to adapt itself to it. Are your kids homeschooled? We did homeschool them for a time. At this point, um, we found a private school that we're happy with. Great. Um, I want to ask you just a couple more questions. Do you have a couple more minutes to answer? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. I want to switch over to the Constitution and specifically how we should read the Constitution. This is great because I was listening to uh, a debate uh, between a couple of uh, law professors, Randy Barnett and Michael Dorf. And I know you were you were there because yeah. during the Q&A at the end, a one a Thomas Woods uh, got up and asked a question. Uh, I don't right. remember what your question was. Um, uh, but what is your perspective on this? Uh, I would imagine that you are some kind of constitutional originalist, but uh, what is, exactly does that mean? Uh, are you an intent originalist or are you a, a textual originalist of some kind with like the public meaning in mind or something like that? How do you approach this? Right. Now, Randy Barnett is a textual originalist. I love and, Randy. Yeah. And he's he's very good on 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 a lot of things. Uh, I, I have some nits to pick here and there, but again, given the state of society, <laughs> I would not exactly say Randy Barnett is my enemy, <laughs> right? But when it comes to the Constitution, I mean, I, you know, even the Constitution is too much government for me, but I still, as a historian, I'm interested in talking about it, and I am interested in, well, what would be the correct way to read this thing? What 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 is the most plausible way to do it? I tend to incline toward, toward the... Um, the intent reading. And and by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, what we're talking about is originalism is the idea that we ought to be looking at what the original – we want to be looking at the Constitution and at the ratifying conventions whereby the Constitution's meaning was hashed out by people. What did people think it meant? What did mm -hmm. people – because that's true of if, – if you, if you have a will, you always want to look at, well, what was the intention of the testator mm -hmm. when, when, when mm -hmm. writing out this will? Good point. So that is part of it. So – so we look at the ratifying conventions. We look at the, now what what the and, and I, I am inclined to think that what they said at those conventions, not not at the Philadelphia convention, because there that was behind closed doors. Nobody could have known what they said. It's more what was said at the ratifying convention, because this is where the document was presented to the public mm -hmm. and where they said, here, this is what you're committing yourselves to. I think that is a public process by which people are told. Here's the nature of the thing you're about to agree to. Mm -hmm. So if that's not where we can look for what this thing means, I don't know where. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what? So that would be an intent originalist. What was the intent of what these, uh, the, this wording meant? Tom, can the I ask you a question here? Does, yeah. it, could intent also mean? And I'm not. I don't know if there's a school for this. Could intent also mean? what the intended principles were behind the words like what the wor what which principles the words were intended to represent and communicate i think so but here here's where i'd get into textual originalism i i think the most extreme case of an of, in fact sometimes they call it original intent and original meaning that's how they uh, often distinguish it and oh, so I, like that. I i would say that the the most um, let's say I, I hate to use the word extreme because a lot of times we use extreme in a as, and it has a negative connotation. I just mean that as literally the person who took it the farthest um, exponent of original meaning was a, a 19th century uh, lawyer named Lysander Spooner. Right, right. And it so happens that um, Randy Barnett is a huge fan of Lysander he Spooner. Mentioned him. And I, That's the only way I know Lysander Spooner. Oh, okay. It's and, and in fact, he, Barnett I think, talks about him. Yeah, the, I think the Lysander Spooner website is in some way either owned or controlled by by, by uh, Randy Barnett. But anyway, Spooner uh, had a bit of an evolution in his thought. But in his earlier thinking, uh, before he kind of just rejected the Constitution altogether because he never consented to it, he had a, a, a lengthy work called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. And that that is a bold title, isn't it? The yeah. unconstitutionality of slavery. Because remember that the, the abolitionists were of the view, like William Lloyd Garrison, that the Constitution sanctioned slavery. Right. And that's why it was a, a contract, a bargain with the devil. And that's why there were abolitionists who would publicly burn copies of the Constitution. Right. And Spooner came along and said, now, wait a minute, not so fast. And it was and Frederick Douglass um, wound up taking up Spooner's analysis. Yes, what he did was... Yes. He looked through the various provisions of the Constitution that have been taken to indicate support for slavery. 
So there's a provision about uh, the slave trade and, and abolish you – know, the slave trade can't be abolished till 1808 and stuff like that. But it doesn't say slave trade, does it? Uh, you know, It talks about importation. Right. But it doesn't talk about the slave trade. In fact, the word slavery – is not, not in, the in the Constitution. Yep. So, so anyway, so there are several clauses that we all sort of know about that deal with slavery. So what he does is he, he, he says, he says slavery is such an abomination. It is such uh, an egregious violation of natural law that we have to strain the meaning of words if that's what it takes uh, before we concede that slavery is allowed in this document. Okay, we, even if we're interpreting it in a way that seems implausible, as long as it's somehow within the realm of possibility of meaning, then the demands of natural law require us to accept that meaning first. He says, mm -hmm. So I don't care what people said in some closed door meeting. I don't care what they said. What, what we have are these words, and I'm going to look at what these words mean. Right. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you perfectly plausible uh, meanings of these different clauses. So I did a, uh, I have a lecture on this that we can link to where I go through. The different, and I show how Spooner interprets them. But his point is, I can interpret these clauses without at any time referring to the institution of slavery. Right. Therefore, it does not pass the test. It 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 doesn't because because our inclination must always be anti-slavery. Right. And you're going to have to have a you got a, a tough road to hope. You're going to convince me otherwise. So that's how he argued that on the basis of original meaning, and that's why original meaning has some draw for me as a as a radical libertarian. Because you know, I say because there are two ways I can be anti-slavery, and uh, um, as an American, I can I can adopt the Spooner view and say the Constitution is anti-slavery, or I can throw over the whole Constitution. Right. Original intent is going to keep me with slavery. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and so that that alone gotcha. makes me inclined toward original meaning. But there's still something that nags at me about that. I still feel like there's something not fully above board about that. You know, right. like if you want to be against slavery, then just say, look, um, we have to go beyond the Constitution on this. I'd rather say that, I think. We have to go beyond – there are some th areas of life where the Constitution just doesn't doesn't answer, you know, and we have to go beyond – rather than say, well, it really is anti-slavery. I would rather just say, look, in this case, we're dealing with such a moral enormity mm -hmm. that we have to – be extra constitutional on it, you know, like yeah. go, go beyond the constitution. I think I'd rather do that. So that's why I feel like if the original intent, if 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 what people were told the meaning was is not the the what governs us, then I think it's just arbitrary. You don't think we could get there just by textual, literal reading of the words? Because I can't see anywhere in the Constitution that would condone slavery, or even if you just added up everything in the Constitution that contradict slavery and then you point to some iffy things that you're not sure about clearly the constitution says that all that that yeah, the declaration yeah. says all men are created equal uh, all of our liberties and the bill of rights and things like this i can't see how the constitution and i think that the best abolitionists and civil rights leaders are people who said we are not living up to the constitution versus the malcolm x like you know the white man's bad and the constitution's bad and all of this Martin but Luther the thing King, is that no. I guess my answer would be that the people who were discussing this certainly uh, that's true. knew they were talking about slavery. Right. That's so that's true. why I would rather just say, uh, look, it's it's a pretty good thing, but it's not perfect. And and you know, rather than say, oh, but look, I just discovered in my laboratory <laughs> that it's actually anti-slavery. So so yeah. I stick to the the originalism. And what originalism gives you. Is an ex is a very limited government. Now, if you just stick to well, I'm gonna def I'm gonna I'm gonna try and figure out what all the words mean. The trouble with that is um, you're gonna argue forever about what general welfare means. Right. But if you go by original intent, then you read what Madison says about general welfare. Right. You read what the uh, ratifiers said about general That's welfare. That's true. And they yeah. and they all say, look, we drew this phrase from the Articles of Confederation, where mm -hmm. everybody knows it didn't mean we can do anything. Right. Right, and so that because otherwise, uh, like uh, re regulating interstate commerce. Well, if you just look at the words, you could imagine somebody saying, "Oh, well, good. The federal government is living up to that today." And now, on the other hand, if you're a really good textualist, textualist, you can find that regulate had rather a different meaning in the in the 18th century than it has today. But interesting. Um, I mean, I basically I think that in general, the textual, the 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 original meaning and original intent uh, interpretations, I think by and large tend to reach the same conclusions. Mm. Like I don't think 
uh, a Scalia and a Randy Barnett have absolutely in you know um, an, an unbridgeable chasm separating them. I, mm-hmm. I don't. So, uh, so then, when you look at the Supreme Court now, since you mentioned Scalia, who is reading the Constitution correctly? Who among our justices is a model for um, what a, a justice should look like? I like Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas. Um, tell me who you like and, and why, and, and how do you feel about the makeup of the court right now? Well, I haven't been able to follow them closely enough to say, but I did read the entire uh, decision, and now I, my, my middle-aged memory, the decision on the, 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 the guy with the bakery, and yeah, did he have yeah. to bake the cake sure. for that, for that mm-hmm. wedding? Um, I, I read that entire thing. I did an episode of my show where I just went through my reading. I listened to that. It was great. It was okay, a great thanks, episode. Thanks. I, I went through the, the decision for the court, and then I went through the, the, um, the uh, dissents, I have and a I little file where I collect things that I need to make, to help me make my arguments. That's in my oh, wonderful! Thanks. This is fantastic. Thanks. And I I thought Gorsuch really uh, acquitted himself well in that decision, uh, and I thought Thomas also uh, did so. Why I like Thomas is that he seems to be the one who is the most likely of anyone on the court to step back from the passing events of the day. And see the larger constitutional issue mm-hmm. at stake. So half the court or more than half the court will be arguing whether the interstate, you know, whether some trivial action by somebody really could be said to affect interstate commerce. Mm-hmm. You know, and we all know it doesn't. Right. We, we all know. You know. Well, if he blew leaves off his yard into a yard <laughs> across into another state, then that guy had to go buy a rake. And he bought that rake in some other state, so it's interstate commerce, so we can regulate the guy blowing leaf. <laughs> and I mean, you know, like we all know that that's a, so. Anyway, so so most of the court will be arguing about whether that constitutes interstate commerce or not. And it'll be Thomas who says, "Could we take a minute to go back and and talk about what was meant to be accomplished by this clause?" And so that's what he'll do in a lot of cases, right. a lot of different types of clauses. He'll say, "Why don't we bother to look at what, instead of getting into this minutia?" Why don't we look at the fundamentals of the case? And, and we need somebody like that. And I don't think anyone does that as reliably as Thomas. Probably so. So um, you are, if I remember right, you are a, a member again of the Libertarian Party. Um, can you give me a, 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 switching over here, can you give me a, a candid sense of the Libertarian Party? Uh, if I remember, you were once at odds, uh, you were at odds with the party at one point, and now you're a member uh, again. Is that right? Well, I wasn't thrilled with people they were nominating for president, but you know I knew there were good people in the Libertarian Party, and I have spoken at many state conventions of the party. I've I've spoken at the national convention. I spoke at it in uh, 2016. So I'm very much in sympathy with what they're trying to do, but but there's a lot of uh, internal division within the party, and some of it is is just is. It's the party bringing it on itself. I mean, here you have an extreme minority party, right, that needs all the help it can get. Mm-hmm. And their chairman picks fights with me constantly. I, I have never, now people think, you know, you hear people about people picking fights and you think, ah, well, you know, I'm probably only going to get half the story from one of the two parties. I'll need to hear from both the parties. And I understand that. But I, I absolutely insist that in no case, at not one of these times, have I thought, you know, today I'm going to pick a fight with the head of the Libertarian Party. That thought would never cross my mind. Not not ever. It, every single time, all of a sudden, I wake up and I'm being attacked by this guy. <laughs> now, I, now, obviously, this is to signal to other people that people who have the kind of view that I gave you earlier, who come to libertarianism basically because uh, – not because I want to be free to live – uh, unusual lifestyles, but precisely because I want to live my boring lifestyle <laughs> and be away from people who want to lecture and hound me about the the benefits of other lifestyles. You know, well then if you want that, you go do that. But I'd like to do this, and this is not enough for for some libertarians. They they want us to sing the positive virtues of of all other ways of living, except they'll never sing the positive virtues of my boring bourgeois life. That right. will not happen. Right. So I so that just kind of makes me a little crazy. But on the other hand, I refuse to give them the satisfaction of leaving. I ain't going nowhere. I refuse <laughs> to give them the satisfaction. I am absolutely staying, especially because I continue to get invited to speak at state Libertarian Party conventions. I have to turn most of them down because I, I just don't 
travel for speaking all that much anymore. But I, you know, I went and spoke at the 2016 convention. I got a thunderous standing ovation there. So you want to give me a hard time, then you better start lecturing your own members. But yeah, I mean, the, the divisions are cultural, but they're also strategic. The, the question would be, what is the purpose of the Libertarian Party? Is it there to get people elected to office, or is it there to have an alternative voice so that when the two bozos are arguing, there's somebody who says, look, they're both wrong in a fundamental way, and it's more important to me that the public understand that than that I myself even get elected. So what what is the – and I personally think there's a way to marry these two things together, and that would be – I think the party should focus, at least at this stage, primarily on races at the most local level, races nobody knows about, right. where you know twenty thousand dollars is all you need to raise, that sort of thing, and then get the libertarian name out there a bit. Now, on the other hand, it's easy for me to say that every four years the presidential election is what gets the libertarian party a lot of attention. And it gets them donations. So it would be hard to withdraw from that scene altogether. I understand that. But it seems like the emphasis is so heavily on congressional and senatorial races instead of these little local races where you can really make a difference on the local level. Uh, so, so, so I think, in other words, you can focus on winning elections, just not these other kinds of elections mm -hmm. where, where these big meta issues are going to come up. These local races, you don't have to argue with them about foreign policy. You don't have to argue with them about the Federal Reserve if you don't want to, because those issues don't even come up. Right. But but when they do come up, then I say if we're not going to speak like libertarians, then we should just forget it. And and there I run into the so-called oh heaven help us pragmatist caucus of the Libertarian Party, where if they just couldn't be more excited to have some retired Republican governor, you know, right. running for you know who's just using them for now. Not now I wouldn't say that about Gary Johnson, but but some they want some. You know, retired politician who then will wipe his feet and go on back to the Republican Party, which has mm -hmm. happened a couple of times now. And that just has no appeal to me whatsoever. And the bizarre thing about this, Jordan, is that these very people who tend to be my biggest critics, these people tend to have leftist cultural sympathies. And, and yet, when push comes to shove, they're the ones who want to vote for Republicans, Republicans turned libertarian. They're the ones who make the Libertarian Party look like it's just for disgruntled Republicans. They, not me, not the fuddy-duddy uh, right-wing bourgeois guy with five daughters. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm the one who wants to vote for the radical libertarian candidate. They want this stuffed shirt from the Republican Party. It's like they're – do you not understand who you're supposed to be and who I'm supposed to be in this situation? Do you think that the problem is the sort of focus on outcomes versus the focus on principles? Because I feel like if we are focusing on natural rights, if we're focusing on uh, you know, property rights and uh, liberty generally, I feel like there can't be too many disagreements. If we all have the same sort of uh, Lockean, Notzikian framework of thinking about what the state is allowed to do. Shouldn't we, even if you believe in gay marriage and, and I don't, or I do and you don't, or whatever, or I don't like smoking pot but think you should be allowed to do it, shouldn't we be able to just come together on the central principles? <laughs> of course. Of course we should. And the funny thing was that during the Ron Paul years, I'm not talking about the Libertarian Party necessarily, but people who incline philosophically in that direction did precisely that because we were so th – thrilled and fascinated to be living through a period of time where young college students would chant, end the Fed. Uh, we couldn't believe this was happening, really. And it caused people of varying backgrounds to come together and just get along. And I still have – and now that has, that has really, really changed mm -hmm. over the past uh, five years or more where we've – you know, kind of broken into warring camps. There was much, much less of that. And we loved each other. And, and we would say, you know, and we would even joke about it. You know, here's my crazy hippie friend over here. And they'd say, yeah, you know, here's my boring old nerd friend. <laughs> but what we loved was that all we wanted was a society where you're free to be a hippie, I'm free to be a nerd. And, you know, where we have, where we change the foreign policy, we change the monetary policy, we decentralize, we, you know, we, we take power out of the hands of, of what people we consider to be sociopaths, and we have a happier life. And that was what we thought we were working toward, and we were so thrilled to see that we had a spokesman who was totally unrehearsed, 
who was not the world's most uh, you know captivating public speaker in the traditional sense, but he was captivating rather in the sense of this guy's actually authentic. He hasn't actually focus grouped one sentence of this whole speech. <laughs> right. I did not know such a phenomenon existed, and so you couldn't look away. <laughs> right. And I'm, yeah, you're right. In principle, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to to pull this off. But these days, unfortunately, uh, and I was I was fearful of this that without you know libertarians like to say, oh, we don't need a leader because we're all individualists. Yeah, 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 yeah. But without that center of gravity, we've gone off in so many different directions, and different directions are okay. But when they're warring factions. Oh, that's just a stupid waste of everybody's time. I, I don't want to do it, but when they start it, I finish it. I mean, that's basically how I was raised. Don't you start with people, but if somebody starts with you, you finish it. I wanted to uh, touch on one last topic. How about Trump? Has Trump been a good president for liberty, all things considered? Does – well, I shouldn't ask this. This is a disingenuous question. Does Trump care about the Constitution? Probably not. But has he governed conservatively? Is Has he been a good uh, president for liberty, all things considered? Okay. Well, has he governed conservatively? Then we have, we thought it was difficult to, to nail down original meaning constitutionalism, the idea of <laughs> what it means to govern conservatively. I don't even know what it means anymore, <laughs> given all the meanings of conservative. But, um, you know, look, there are pluses and minuses with him. Uh you know, in in that the Supreme Court is a key thing, and there's just no getting around that. Right. Maybe there are a lot of things about Trump that rub you the wrong way, but that Supreme Court can be an imperial institution, and that's precisely why you have so many Democrats talking about packing the court. They want to add right. five or six more justices to the court, and I predicted that would happen uh, after the Kavanaugh uh, uh, hearings. I predict I said these people are not just going to roll over and say, "Well, for the next thirty years, we lost the court." That is not how the left operates ever. Um, the right is very good at being obedient losers. You know, they'll sit back and they'll give conferences about why it's good for us to be losers because we're abiding by the rules or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, whereas the left is they're going to burn the thing to the ground before they lose. Right? They're going to get out there and fight. So I knew that was coming. Uh, and, and he has given – I mean, now, Kavanaugh I'm not as big on, but I do think Gorsuch was about as good as we were going to get given the plausible candidates. And so – that's a that's a significant thing, uh, and a lot of times the good that the court can do is is by doing nothing. It's by not intervening. It's right. by not by not engineering more social revolutions right. in the country. Secondly, it is true that on deregulation, he really has been good. If you look at the numbers in terms of new regulations versus repealed ones, he's been very good on that. Mm -hmm. My colleague Bob Murphy, who's a, a specialist in energy policy, says, look, the energy policy community, the free market energy policy community, is delighted with, with, with Trump, even if they don't like his personality or whatever that other stuff is. Where, But to me, the big issues are not I – mean, yeah, sometimes he says things that he shouldn't say, whatever, you know, I mean I – at this point, if you don't have a thick skin in America, you know, you're never going to have one. Right. But, but to me, the, the much bigger issues are two of my big ones, which would be foreign policy. Um, I think that the, the foreign policy, at least of the past 20 years, has not been conservative and has not been – has not racked up a lot of victories. Uh, it's, been, it's been really a disastrous foreign policy, and, and he kind of knows that on some level. But he's surrounded himself by uh, dead enders who just are going to continue the same mistakes over and over that are just blowing a lot of money on crazy enlightenment schemes. You know, well, we need to have more women's schools in Afghanistan or something. I mean, this is absurd. Your society's collapsing uh, socially. We're totally – we have a society that's at war. Half of it is at war with the other half. I think we got to focus on that primarily. Uh, but he's surrounded himself by people who kind of want to keep it going, and then he wants to increase the budget. When the U.S. is spending as much on the military as all other countries combined, that's not sustainable. So that's a disappointment given his rhetoric before. And then on the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, he just wants more low interest rates as if, as if the choice is low interest rates and prosperity and high interest rates and, and, and uh, recession. When – if that were as easy as it was, this sounds like the left when they say – you know, what we need are unions and high minimum wages, and then we'll be prosperous. Okay, do you really think we go to Bangladesh and we say, look, I can't believe how stupid we've been all these years. Why didn't we tell you guys that all you need to lift out ourselves out of poverty is unions and a minimum wage? That would do nothing other than make people in Bangladesh even more unemployable than they currently mm -hmm. are. So likewise with the Fed, 
uh, you got to let it. You got to let interest rates go where they're going to go. The same way you got to let the price of milk go where it's going to go. And if you don't then you wind up mispricing things and introducing distortions mm -hmm. and sowing the seeds for later problems. So it's it's but on the other hand, compared to what? Right. How many presidents have we had who really understood the Fed right. and, and monetary policy? I mean basically none. So maybe you'll say I'm being unfair in how I evaluate him. And on foreign policy, compared to what? They've all been disasters on foreign policy. Right. So compared to what? Right. So on the things where he's bad I think he – now, there are some exceptions where things that he's bad where he's somewhat worse than others. But generally Tariffs? the things that he's Tariffs? bad on I – mean, yeah, I think on trade he's been, he's been worse. But the things he's good on, he's generally better than his predecessors have been. Like on deregulation, he's much better. And on the court, I think he's um, at least somewhat better than mm -hmm. his predecessors. So you know, that's basically what we've got. I don't see – given the – Americans are not libertarians. That's a fact. That is a brute fact. They are not going to vote for a libertarian. They've made that clear. They they want the government to do X and Y, and it's our job to convince them that they shouldn't need that. Yeah, that's but right. given that given that that's what we've got, well, I mean, who is the plausible person out there who would have done better? I'm not saying therefore you got to go out and rah 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 for the guy. I'm asking a question: Who is a, an electable person who would have done better? Because of course we can say. Well, he's a disaster on X and Y and Z, and I agree. Yes, I know that. But I'm asking myself, right now in 2019, what can I legitimately hope for? Mm -hmm. I have two sets of hopes, what I really want to see and what I hope my girls live to see and what I can plausibly reach for right now. Right. I plausibly cannot abolish the Fed. I, right. I can't. There are a lot of things I can't do, but maybe I could tilt the court in a certain direction and maybe I could get rid of some regulations. So, you know, that's how I look at it. And, and lastly, how about his free speech, his new campus free speech executive order, um, whether or not you uh, as a purist completely agree with whether or not he, he should have done that or if that should be an executive order. Do you think that it's going to work? Do you think it will enhance freedom and protect students' liberties? Well, I found out, and I haven't read the whole thing myself, but I found out that it it actually the stuff about free speech is not the majority of the text of that thing. It has to do more about the tra being more transparent about the costs of education and stuff like that. So it's I don't know I wouldn't I don't know if I'd call it a bait and switch, but I know that people who favor free speech are actually saying we need more than this. There's mm. no enforcement mechanism mm. and and whatever. Um, but of course, what it goes to show is once the state you know once the federal government is involved in in handing out federal funding to universities, well, then you wind up with, you know, maybe you don't like a president interfering in their speaker invitation policy. Well, you got to take with the good with the, if you're going to take the money, right. then you're going to, you, then you're going to be subjecting yourself to this. Now, the trouble would be that then the next president comes in with an executive order and says, uh, I'm going to withhold funding from anybody who allows a, um, a, basically a dissenting voice. You know, they'll call it a, a racist, but that just means anybody. That, that means, means anybody they don't ben like. Ben Shapiro, whoever they don't like. Ben Shapiro would be would be ruled out as a racist. And and I don't see on what possible grounds you could call Ben Shapiro a racist. There's no way. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no way. And th I could easily see them saying, now you don't get funding because you allowed this person. On, because basically we're going to come up with a category that we'll use to demonize everybody we dislike. And if you have anything to do with those people, then we'll withhold your funding. Right. Uh, you know, I would want to be a university that doesn't rely on that kind of funding. I would want to go to my donors and say, look, w we don't want to be subject to the – we're here, in principle at least, to look for the truth and to acquire knowledge and to, and to engage in real meaningful research that improves human welfare. And we should not be subject to the changing – the ever-changing whims of a uh, federal government. And what we need is industry – and private um, philanthropists and benefactors to help us do this job independently so that we can have a campus where we do what we darn well please. <laughs> we ban people we want to ban. We invite people we want to invite. And if you don't like it, then don't send your kid here. But that's what our Great. university is about. Yeah. That's the model they should be going toward. Well, thank you so much for joining the program, Tom. Uh, keep waking up every day and doing what you're doing because it's fantastic. And where can my listeners um, interact with you? My podcast is at tomspodcast.com, and you should subscribe on iTunes. You'll get a lot of great episodes. But what I'm known for almost as much as the podcast is something that people are going to recoil from, 
and that is my email newsletter. They're going to say, oh, I get so much email already. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's something special about the Woods newsletter. I mean, mm. I mean I, 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 there are a lot of things I'm not good at at all, and I will openly admit it. But one thing I've gotten pretty good at is is an email newsletter that people look forward to getting. I agree with it, that. It's a zinger. I mean, it's a zinger, and you're going to enjoy it. And to get on that, I actually, I actually bribe you a little bit. I have an ebook. Bernie called, Sanders, right? Oh, I have, I have an ebook called Bernie Sanders is Wrong, and you can go to <laughs> BernieIsWrong.com and pick that up, and you'll get on my list. Another way to get on my list is I have an ebook of of uh, professors who went through the ringer, the, who stood up to the PC mob and lived to tell the tale, and you're going to love hearing their stories. And I put them together in an ebook called Think for Yourself, and the subject line is something like, you know, professors who resisted the mob tell their stories. And that is over at againstthemob.com. And that likewise will put you on my list. And you'll also enjoy and if all you want is the ebook, you can get the ebook and then just unsubscribe from my list. But don't do that because you're going to be <laughs> depriving yourself of one of life's pleasures. I agree. Again, thank you so much. It was great talking with you and I hope you'll consider coming on sometime in the future. And uh, uh, once again, I uh, appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay, so what a fun interview. So that's it for this episode of the Western Canon Podcast. I'm Jordan Alexander Hill. Stay tuned for upcoming guests, including Gina Santiago, Edith Hall, and several others. Thanks for listening, and happy reading. Happy reading.